OTB's The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship. Welcome along to episode eight of season two of The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship and the Legends Tour Series at Croke Park. We're going to have a repeat of the All-Ireland Final in two weeks' time in the League Decider after Limerick once again came from behind to beat Tipperary in the second half of a game under John Kiley. And Kilkenny got a measure of revenge against Cork, defeating them at Nolan Park in the second of the semi-finals to progress to the Division 1 Decider. The Division 2A Final will be played this coming Sunday in Port Leash, and that will pit awfully against against Kildare to replace Leash, who lost out to Westmead in the relegation playoff on Saturday in Division 1 for 2024. Delighted as always, we've got Paul Murphy and James Skehill alongside me. How are you getting on, lads? How's it going, lads? Good, how are things? Uh, plenty to talk about. We had a record pod last week, Skehill. Um, I'd just like to say thank you uh, for part of that. <laughs> uh, you went reasonably viral online. You've not been assassinated in the seven days since we spoke, so that's a good sign. I've had to charge my phone twice a day, every day since the podcast. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> but I have to say, it's been 95% positive. Hmm. Yeah, it was. No, I, I, I'd say that was true with the commentary around it as well. Like, Did you get any blowback for your comments? I read the art. You get the art comment here and there. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like politics. If you say if in the GA, if you make a statement or say something about someone, someone's going to come after you. You know, <laughs> Someone's going to come after you. Now, I will say, I will say, I will not apologize for the content. Maybe my delivery was a bit strong. Fair, <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's Don't a sign work. of growth, lads. Yeah. Right. <laughs> delivery was a bit strong, and I put my hand up and say, yeah, that's, it was a bit strong on my behalf. Like, I carried away. My hey, dear man. Don't ever roll back. There was our record pod, <laughs> uh, as I think I confirmed to you guys at the weekend. Yeah. I had a quick look back through the stats at the back end <laughs> of the website and I went, you know what? There's a few thousand extra listens added on here. I think this uh, may well have got some traction in WhatsApp so, groups so, and so what you're me with, So what you're telling me with is more of the same? I oh, know what I'm telling you is you don't court controversy for the sake of it. I saw one or two people going, oh, look, these lads are going for controversy here on the oh. TikTok clip. It actually wasn't. It was genuinely in the middle of a chat. This is where sometimes mm. people think that you're sensationalizing something. These were Scales genuinely held views. And we were talking about, you know, Davy Fitz and what he said about his team ahead of yeah. championships. So had, like, and it was in fairness, it was pure genuine because I had just, you know, to my demise, I had just read the article mm. about what he had said about the, the, the state he got the Waterford team. And I was like, that's not, that's not kind of Liam Cahill. That's, that's a bit disrespectful. So maybe my emotions were a bit heightened. <laughs> so that's why I went off as hard as I did, you know. Yeah, and look, I think if anyone has been listening to us over the last year and a half at this stage, we don't tend to go negative and we don't tend to like go, right, here's that controversial moment from the weekend. Let's see if they should have been sent off or let's start a campaign for someone to be retrospectively banned. Generally, mm. we're pretty positive. We're three guys who like our hurling. And it just turned out that we were discussing comments that Skehel was very interested in and perhaps a little bit emotionally involved in. Mm. And therefore, he let loose. And I think everyone has enjoyed it over the last week. I mean, Murph, how many people have come up to you over the last week and went... I either agree or disagree with Skehill's comments. I reckon it's quite a few people. Oh, yeah, nine out of ten. Uh, actually, I didn't meet anyone in person that says they disagreed with what he was saying. And to be honest, look, from, like you said, there was no plan there to go in any great depth um, in terms of Davy or anything like that. But I thought it was all fairly balanced. And, yeah, there was, there was an element of passion in it. But, you know, with lots of topics we talk about here, there's an element of passion in it as well. But, no, look, lots of people saw exactly where he was coming from. And a lot of people, it's probably since we started, it was the biggest topic that people came up to me during the week and actually said, I'm, much, I'm just after watching this or after watching that and kind of saying fair play for a very honest uh, view in it from scale. Like, so there was no, I, in person, I met nobody who said that was completely unfair or anything like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, hold on and we'll have a look at the comments later because online, <laughs> when you've oh. got people who've got usernames like user123456.7, uh, you generally get slightly different comments to those who are genuinely going, do you know what, actually, that was very entertaining. I really liked the pod last week. And <laughs> I was I was at a Republic of Ireland event on Saturday night and I had people coming up talking to me about, Jesus, I heard your hurling pod at the weekend. So it's all good exposure. I think the two things that have been, I've been talked about the most or people I've bumped into about the pod this season... Um, don't curb Skell's language no matter what after what her his mother said earlier this year and now his comments about Davy Fitz. So look, your box office scale, that's all I can Oh god, yeah. Sometimes I wish I wasn't just a <laughs> But it just goes to show like like GEA in Ireland, oh god, it can get people emotional. Hmm. Oh yeah, my yeah. god. Yeah, it can get people very emotional. Like a bit sometimes a bit excessive, you know. Yeah. We'll dive into it later. 
We will. I even like I watched the I don't know if you guys said around after the Sunday game last night. I because the hurling was first and that was so exciting. I found out middle of the afternoon yesterday they were going with hurling first. Um because one of the producers on the show had asked me for a couple of bits and pieces and they, I said jokingly, I was like, Is the hurling going to be on at eleven again? And they were like, No, good news, half past nine, you're getting about an hour of hurling to start the show. And I was like, Please. Happy days, especially on the last day of the football league. I was not expecting that. Mm. And then to keep the hurling community happy afterwards, they re-showed two episodes of the game afterwards. Remember the hurling documentary uh, that came out a few years ago? And mm. you got to be emotional when you watch that and you hear all the talk about, you know, the history of the game and showing some of the great players of the game and everything as well. So if you were a hurling fan last night, you were actually really well treated with the amount of coverage that was there. And TG Carr even streamed the Division 1 relegation game on Saturday, which I wasn't expecting as well. So uh, bizarrely enough, we got more hurling coverage on a football-dominated weekend, Murphy, than we did the week before when it was the last round of the hurling. We did, yeah. Um, and again, I suppose it's, it's a matter of you're trying to nearly plan at times at certain weekends. You're judging the matches. Are the people who plan these things looking at some going, they're going to be a dead rubber? It doesn't necessarily mean that other people don't want to watch it. Um, but we were treated to, if you wanted to watch the matches over the weekend, there was decent coverage with it. And I suppose as well, which was good, was the fact that, look, we had two... You know, we had the two semi-finals at the weekends as well, so it was very, very targeted in terms of what we knew was going to be on. Um, but no, it was good. You know, you couldn't have too much complaints over it at the weekend. All right, we'll kick things off maybe with the game on Saturday because they were described as chalk and cheese these two semi-finals, and maybe the quality was a little bit different scale. But Saturday was really good, and once again there was a bit of a pattern here, which was picked up by Column Keys. I know this is one that you threw into the WhatsApp group. I found this really remarkable though. Eleven games that John Kiley has managed Limerick against Tipperary. Tipperary have never won a second half. Limerick have been on a cumulative score down by two points in every one of those games, so minus twenty-two. Yeah. After halftime in the 11 games, Limerick plus 69 points. Now, some of that is probably helped by the 16-point turnaround in the Munster final a few years ago. But that is quite remarkable, what Limerick have done to Tipperary on a consistent basis over the last six or seven years. Yeah, it is. like, And I was just talking to a friend of mine, Paul Kilgannon, who would be, you probably know him, he's, he's the author of The Coach Carver. <clears throat> and we had a good discussion on Saturday uh, on the way to the minor game. And, on the phone, obviously, and he was asking me, he, he, he's the type of fellow that will trigger questions in your mind. He won't give you the answer, he'll trigger it. And he was saying, everyone's looking at Limerick and the great players, which they are, but he said, nobody's asking why. Like, why are they so good and, and the how, do you know what I mean? So, like, that's that is is class. It looks brilliant. It just shows Limerick domination, second half. But he is saying to me, like, go back a few years and how Limerick have found game plans and trained themselves, you know, for every situation. Like, we mentioned last year that they always have the answer. They always have the answer. And in his view, uh, which I, I agree with, Limerick nearly sort of half plateaued last year. And he thinks that they've kind of re-jigged some things, re themselves and kind of further developed and they're going to blitz everyone this year. And it's hard to see. It's, it's hard to go against them. It's hard to see to pick a reason or pick pick a team you know, that's going to take them down because they just look, they have this um, aura of invincibility. And I think if Tipperary cross Limerick again in future, which they will, obviously, and let's say they're three or four points up at half time. I guarantee you that's in the back of the mind again. I guarantee it's in the back of the mind that these lads are coming and have we got the tools to stop them? And it's a major question and it's, it's an awful place to be when you're meeting a, a team as, as grand as Limerick. So look, they're seriously impressive. Um, like I'd love to see, I'd love to get exposed to their training, let's say, or, their, or how they train to, to, to become as good as they are. Um, but they're just so efficient like their ball work is like nothing I've ever seen from any team to be honest how they get they have only two passes the pass one pass either goes to hand or goes to space there's nothing else there's no in-betweens there's no shit balls on the ground there's no high balls down amongst corner forwards you know let's say in no man's land it's just either to space or to the hand and they are absolutely amazing at it and one final point for me did you see the score uh, what minute was I have it here in my notes I think it was 37th minute they were yeah 37 just after half time six passes from the back and doesn't hit the ground and Lynch puts it over the bar yeah and like that's mm. not six passes unopposed that's six passes in traffic opposed going through Tipperary doesn't hit the ground that is just if you did that without any Tipperary guys it'd be hard enough <laughs> you know, to execute yeah. that full length but when you introduce Tipperary lads and have, and have the efficiency and execution they had is just amazing 
that second Keane Lynch score, I think he was done a little bit dirty uh, by the highlights last night because on League Sunday, the second uh, longer range point which he scored, which is a cracker, didn't actually yeah. make the final highlights. But that one did where the passes were coming off the shoulder, which you just mentioned, where, again, Tipperary were trying to put the same press on Murph they did in the first half, which was quite effective. We can maybe talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. But when Limerick were coming out there, it was a hand pass off the shoulder. It was a reverse pass. It was back to Lynch. And Lynch then had enough space and time to decide, right, I'm not going to go for another pass or to try and move it. Decided to take a shot, clinical between the posts, probably summed up what Limerick did really well. Yeah, and as, as Skettle was saying there, like it's it's this ability to, I suppose, adapt to the challenge that's in front of them. In the first half, they kind of went down into these cul-de-sacs at times and Tipperary turned them over. And fair play to Tipperary for turning them over. It's not an easy thing to do, involves a lot of work, but... Um, you know, maybe we saw the small bit of the attrition rate of that in the second half. But, you know, like that, Limerick just mix it up so well. They don't have any one set game plan. And each time someone receives the ball, you can almost see them thinking as to what's the next best thing to do with this ball. Yeah. And But they all have the skill to then go, OK, well, if if the lad's inside, if if, if I am essentially the, la- the last person in the best position now with the ball, whereby nothing in front of me now is open up, they're well able to take their long-range points, which always buys them the extra few yards the next time because the Tipperary boys or whoever the opposition is have to now step back up onto them. And that's where you see again where in the same situation when Keane Lynch gets the ball the next time, his man is that two or three yards closer and now that space has opened up again for Keane Lynch to pop the hand pass. So they just, you know, they, they, they go back and forth between that game. And something I was really impressed with as well is what they've even brought a step further now of the person coming out of defence might be a person who receives the ball in the 21, pops it, makes a run. And it's not even a case that they make a run because they see the ball, they might get the ball back in the next 20 or 25 yards. They're thinking 50, 55 yards, 60 yards, that I'm going to create this run. And where I'd be thinking there as another Limerick player would be that, you know, if a Limerick player gets a ball around the midfield, even if there's no apparent player on, if they hold the ball for a second or two more, they know that it's going to develop, that there's lads running because lads automatically run and support the person in possession. So they have that that other teams don't have. If you look at other teams, sometimes when that player gets the ball in the same position, they see there's nothing on to go, oh, there's nothing on, I'm going to deliver the ball. But Limerick don't do that. Limerick go, if I hold on to this and I'm well capable of doing it, something's going to open up for me here now where I can pop the ball off. Yeah. And like that's different level stuff. And alternatively, on the flip side, you see the likes of Peter Casey picking up balls in his own in within his own 45. So the forwards are working in the as defenders and the defenders are driving forward supporting the forwards. So they're again they're evolving their game that bit more and where I see something going forward really that the opposition teams will have to look at is I don't think full forward lines quite often are mentally prepared to chase their own man down the pitch, which is a statement that wouldn't have to have happened maybe 10 years ago. But now, full forward lines are going to have to prepare for chasing more so Barry Nash and potentially Mike Casey. We saw Mike Casey popping up again in the far 45 at times. Sean Finn, maybe not as much, but he does do it. But it's this thing of, you know, where am I needed? Where, and that's where I'm going to go. And I would say Peter Casey typified that at the weekend. He just went... And it shows how important he is. He just goes, where am I needed? That's where I'm going. And he's ferocious in the tackle. So there's so many things to pull apart with Limerick that in the second half, this verse, they didn't really do it in the first half. But in the second half, there were so many things to admire about how they played. Yeah, Skell, one that stood out for me, because you can use the goalkeeper union on this one, which was another score in the second half, which came from Tom Morrissey, which was Quaid picks up the ball. You're almost expecting when he leans over to his right-hand side that Nash is going to get a short stick pass and then they'll move it on. Instead, he goes long. He put it into Tom Morrissey's hand so accurately that Morrissey was actually able to just get a strike off without breaking stride. Like, that is unbelievable accuracy from the goalkeeper. Yeah, it's beautiful. But it's also, like, if you were to go behind the goal, you wouldn't see... Obviously, Morrissey collects the ball in Collett X spot. But as soon as Nicky gets the ball, Morrissey's in Y spot. He's, he's probably 20, 30 yards infield. You know what I mean? So Nicky then has drawn Morrissey into the ball. So instead of hitting it where Morrissey is, he's putting the ball where he's going to be. So he's put yeah. off out the wing. Morrissey recognises that, just keeps moving and just lands in sequence. It's just like a quarterback pass you'd see in NFL. That they just, it's like the two things come together and they meet at a point. So it's just recognition again from, from Nicky. And like, Murphy has hit the nail on the head there. It's like I call it, it's called pattern recognition. They, they, all the players can just recognise the pattern before anybody else can. So like, you, you use Nash as a prime example for it. 
Like as soon as a ball goes to, I don't know, Jim Burns, Nash can recognise if I go this way. You know, yeah. Jim is like he'd turn in and I'm going to get the ball. And it happens, you know, mm. <laughs> one teen amount of times. And it's not just, it's not um, like they don't, they don't how to say, recognise it there and then. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is practice in the training field. This is this is like an ecosystem. This is like yeah. they all come into it and they all know exactly what they're at. If and I said we said before, if you were to turn the Limerick team around, put the forwards up in the backs and the backs in the forwards, yeah. no problem, no problem. Like not, not an issue. They all yeah. they all play it, no problem. Like, it's just they're that good. And I just think there are, there's, I know people will go, traditionalists will go on about the system, the system, but the system is perfect. It's absolutely yeah. perfect. Yeah. And like, it's, people keep asking me, how do you beat them? And it's such a hard question to answer because the way you beat them is if you beat them. You can't beat them at their own game. Let's get that very straight. Mm. But the trouble is, their own game is the, is the game nowadays. Whether we like it or not, hurling is now a running game. Yeah. You know, it's a running game. So I'm sorry to say the long ball tradition is, you know, poking the ball as, as far as you can, as quick as you can, just do some work against teams like Limerick because they'd chew you up and then they work it out against you. So like, it's like, then you need to start looking at other sports. How are we going to adopt this more? You know, <laughs> like how do football teams, that's the way I'm looking, is how do football teams evolve? You know, yeah. to beat a running game. It's like, it's a very, very hard question to answer. And I'm sure there's inter-county managers asking the same question. How are we going to get on these lads? And no answer just yet. And the thing is, Murph, it may have looked like Tipperary had some of the answers in the first half of the weekend because they were forcing Limerick into awkward situations. They were making it very uncomfortable with the turnovers. This we had seen Tipperary do against Kilkenny earlier this season too. So Cal had very clearly instructed their half-forward line especially to work remarkably hard to make it difficult on the second sequence of possession. But yet in the second half, now Declan Hannan said in his interview afterwards that actually... Kinnerk and Kylie had told them to make a few tactical changes with their approach and that started to work. The difficulty is if a team like Tipperary can do that for 35 minutes but then can't do it in the second half, it becomes incredibly difficult. You might have the right template <laughs> but maybe not able to actually do it for the full 70. Absolutely. And the bottom line may come down to, you can talk about, you know, unhinging all these lads, their structures, Limerick structure and this and that. At the end of the day, when it comes down to 15 and 15, Limerick has an exception of 15 and 15 that can bring it back to basics and just out hurry and that's it. But I admire Tipperary for going about, my belief is that this is, if a team is going to beat Limerick, this is how they're going to have to do it. It's, I mean, it's incredibly hard work and I know people look at it and go, oh, you can't sustain that for 70 minutes. But that's what the team is going to have to do because you're going to have to enforce such a game on Limerick that pushes them a little bit away from the game that they want to play and gets them into kind of dead ends, which which Tipperary, it was, I was actually really encouraged by it that they actually managed to do it at times. Limerick probably just had a bit of class in the second half and like that we're able to go in at half time and go okay I can see what they're trying to do let's now move around them which they're able to do they're able to go okay well, let's this is what we're going to do and to take it a step further a team has yeah. to nearly go and adapt to that then again um, and it's that evolution that look unfortunately for opposition teams Limerick have just set the bar to here and that bar is moving it's getting it's getting harder again and teams the chase and pack are making valid attempts and good cracks and like you can take you can guarantee teams will look at what Tipperary did at the weekend and go well maybe we have the personnel to stay that for 70 minutes like Cork for example you could look at that and say well we actually have a we have a bench there like we have players Kilkenny will look at that Galway will look at that and go well if we come across them we'd like to fancy our chances that we could replicate that to a certain degree and then go and play our own game and have the personnel to go and beat them. Doesn't mean they're going to be able to do it. But there is markers there that team can look at teams can look at. But it's always with the terms and conditions that Limerick when they go in at half time, and you could probably point that back to Kenny, let's say, in the mid two thousands, where it's this thing you come out after half time and suddenly they, they come at you with something that wasn't happening in the first half. So teams just have to swallow it and go, but that's what Limerick are going to bring on any given day. But nevertheless, we spoke here last week saying that Tipperary you know, there was markers here that they could come away and go, well, that's encouraging, that's good, this is good. And I think they came away with those markers. And we even said that if, if you know, Limerick go and win by six points, that's still not, you know, all is lost for Tipperary. But it was really interesting, in fairness, like you said, to start Colin Keyes' um, stat there. Like, that is a psychological thing that maybe Limerick or Tipperary might have to deal with. Like, you know, even if they go out and meet, meet Limerick again, do this in the first half, they win at half time. They have to go, right, lads. However hard that was, we're going to have to up it here again. Um, but it's look. I just think it, it, it's very admirable that to see where Limerick are that they're capable of doing something like that to a team in the second half. Well, with, another thing that was uh, in Guanskell with five all stars on the bench. Five yeah. all stars on the bench, and as well with that, you look at t- Limerick had eight scorers that scored two points or more, but Tipperary just had six scores. Like there's a stat in itself where like. 
there you, you know you can kind of understand where it came from the spread it's yeah. it, like it, it it nearly speaks the story there like 12 players scored for Limerick so you can see scores were coming from everywhere but Tipperary was a little bit more coming from the expected routes so yeah. that's something as well the level of surprise that Limerick and, and, and the adaptability there that's huge Some, yeah someone had a great tweet um Eddie Brennan actually had a good tweet saying that uh, two of the Limerick backs held, held scoreless. <laughs> yeah, Sl- <laughs> sloppy stuff from Sean Finn, Mike Casey, and Mickey Quaid not to score because everyone from number four to fifteen scored at least once in the game. That, that that's that's insane stuff. Like you can afford scoring fourteen points for Tip and Alan Tynan, who's very good. I thought chipped in with four yeah, points as well, but they spread their scores perfectly. Burns and Galan scored the freeze, and everyone else contributes in play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and even Burns, did Burns get a point or two from I think a point, point from play as well. Point yeah. play, um, course, yeah, yeah. and even Mike Casey, bar a bad handling error, not a bad handling error, but a handling error which is unlike Limerick in the first half, potentially was true on goal. You know, if, if they were saying that, yeah, which is was, ridiculous. Was, yeah. A full back running straight up the middle, like you know, and who's going to stop him? You know, he's like, it, it, you know, it'd be like having a prop run at you, like the size of him. So I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, it's 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 remarkable stuff. And their goal scale came from something that was a little bit more route one as well, uh, where it comes in yeah. high. And maybe this thing that will disappoint Tipperary is that they should really have been able to deal with the ball that came in for the goal. And even the fact that when the ball came down, they had two defenders who were swarming round at the time that Peter Casey caught the ball, but he was able to turn swivel and eventually kick the ball into the net. They'll probably be disappointed defensively they didn't defend that a little bit better. Oh, they will. Like, that, that's, I think that's rule number one like, for a full back line <clears throat> or for a goalkeeper. If it comes into your square, you've got to deal with it. You've got to get to the ground, first of all. You cannot allow a forward to secure primary possession because if you do, you're in big trouble. First of all, you won't, you, you won't know he has it. That's the first thing. And the second thing is you've lost time. So if you get to the ground, you have some chance. I actually think, I think it was Barry Nash that hit the, hit the strike, was it? Am I wrong? Right? I think it became long. Yeah, I think I it think was Nash. It, I, I can't work out was it a shot, an attempted shot, or was it a delivery because we've seen these deliveries before. Um, with only Aaron Galan in the square. So you wouldn't see it with Flanagan, you wouldn't see it generally with Peter Casey, you know, um, and you never see it with Hazel Hegarty in the square where a high ball goes into them. So we've seen it a couple of times where Galan comes in, ghost behind you, so after half plays your hurl and then it's, it's true on goal. Happened a couple of times against Kilkenny back a few years ago, Murph. Yeah. You know, was it a semi final or a quarter final? I can't quite remember, but um, like, this, it's a rarity for Limerick, so I think that's why Barry was going for a shot as opposed to as opposed to a goal. But even that, like, like Peter Casey, for a man of his stature, I mean, that's a nice way be able to come down with it and finish it first of all the wherewithal to finish it with his boot with his surroundings was, was, was fabulous but again it's a dimension to the game that, that you rarely see with Limerick like we, re- we rarely see it we never see a ball pumped into a square do we it's always as I said to you at the pass either to hand or to space and it's never to the square on a rarity and still when it does go to get a bit of change out of it another dimension to the game jeez <laughs> and Mark, when it comes to that efficiency from Limerick too so they had one shot that went short in the last minute so they didn't miss a single shot in the second half until then they outscored Tipperary in that second half 115 to 9 points like that's remarkable when there should be pressure on because you're trailing because Tipperary in the game physically because they've been getting turnovers and yet this team comes out like a machine in the second half and just rips them to shreds like that's devastating stuff yeah, and it's almost as if it just focuses their mind on the job in hand. Um, I don't think they went out with uh, with any complacency or anything at the weekend. Um, I, I just think that, you know, Tip brought a small bit more... Tip, tip were quite clinical in the first half, really, and, you know, they worked really hard and they, they, they actually worked a lot of scores really well in terms of creating opportunities for themselves. But it's like when Limerick understand their task at hand, it focuses their mind. And that's kind of the, the attitude of... of you know, champions is that they go, this is the job at hand. We're going to take ownership of this now and go at it. And this, they, they tend to thrive. They hit this kind of a flow mode nearly that, like they were pinging balls over from everywhere. Ne- nothing was going wrong. It's almost as yeah. if they, they knew that we we're going to work the ball here and you could see it. And uh, uh, something is, is great as well is the Limerick supporters are almost part of it as well because you can, they sense what's happening at the same time. And there was great scores going over. And it was acknowledged by the stand. And, it, and it's like the tip player or the Limerick players feed off this then because they can, it feels like this momentum is happening. And, you know, teams will have to fight that as well because it's, it's like you think of all the great sports, you know, I think you go down to Toman Park with Paul O'Connell and these ads and the crowd were nearly in on top of the pitch. And, you know, you, you, there's these places that are like fortresses. Wherever Limerick go at the moment and they get into that purple patch, it's the, the, the Limerick crowd get behind them and that in itself seems to feed into what the Limerick lads are doing and it just it, it, that that phase in the second half there where they started building momentum and they got a bit of traction 
and they were just popping scores from everywhere. That just showed like the class that they have. Yeah. And like teams are hoping that when they catch Limerick in the first 20 minutes or whatever, that Limerick don't get that phase and that potentially a team could, they could have that purple patch, maybe go in at halftime a few points ahead and then try and tackle the purple patch that Limerick will have in the second half. But it's just such a, you know, it's such a steamroller of a, of a phase they get into that it's so good to watch. As long as they're not playing your team, it's so good to watch. But it just goes to show that they are these kind of once in a generational team that, you know, it's, it's phenomenal to watch when it's in full flow. Well, Skell, if you're going to drive the stake into this Limerick team under John Kiley, you have to keep the scoring ticking over. That was a yeah. big problem for Tip 2. So three points in play in the entire second half of those nine points they scored. Yeah. So Ford's freeze were kind of keeping it moving a little bit. But this is a Tip team who we talked about were averaging 33 points a game, scoring loads of goals as part of that in their run to the league semi-final too. But yes, they didn't trouble the Limerick goal at the weekend. Yeah, but their goals were coming from pace runners, and I just think that they were stopped. Like, there's the they met a brick wall in Limerick, and like the the Limerick, the, their setup is is phenomenal. Like, I was just I was assessing the second half there, watching the game this morning. Like, and you know when a ball goes over, let's say they, they, they hit a score and the crowd is behind them, players can get probably just lost in the moment for a couple of seconds, and then they tune back into their job. The Limerick, the, the average time of the Limerick reset was three seconds. So what I mean by that is the ball goes over the bar, right? Now, start start the clock. One, two, three, the forwards in position for the reset. Like, it's just, I, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. I can't get over, like, so if you're looking for an area to go attack them, you know, I haven't found one yet. Because mm. there's, again, they clog up the middle so well. They're, they're so good now from 45 to 45 to making that a complete war zone. Runs through the middle are very hard. You're depending on a break. You know, you're depending on a break or just an extremely good pass. Like, there's, a, again, another note here I have. Uh, 26 minutes there was a foul in Norm McGrath there was 22 players inside the 45-65 22 players were in that zone you know uh, there was a, it was Tipper obviously attacking so the the Limerick 65 Limerick 45 22 players <laughs> like wow. I mean there's only 8 players they got 2 goalies so only 6 outfield players in the rest of the pitch that's how much they absolutely congested and they're, they're such good athletes that if they go either direction they have you you know so mm. if they go forward they can just move it so well so how to get around them Jesus, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I don't know, Janice. I swear to God, I don't know. But you have to manage the game as well as we were saying, more like the like, that, Euros. That's the tsunami coming against you when they have the crowd mm. behind you. You can feel it also as a neutral. You've got to stop that. You've got to just go down with injury, just and kill the whole thing and stop it as best you can. Because when they get rolling, that jeez, you, and you start playing at their tempo, you're in trouble. You're in serious yeah. trouble. So stop that. Stop the crowd. Stop everything if you can. But for all that talk, scale about teams getting closer, and this has been, you know, kind of what's been coming out of the Limerick camp in particular. I was even listening to Barry Hennessy earlier today. He was saying, no, no, genuinely, I think the teams are getting closer to Limerick right now. If the team who've been the most potent scorers during the league, and definitely the team who created and took the most goal chances throughout, if they can't score goals against this Limerick team, I don't see anyone out pointing them this year. No, they won't, definitely not, because there's no team that's in the championship the last four years that's had more shots than them. And their shots, and we've, we spoke about before, their shots, Barrett, Jim and Burns the odd time, their shots are in a very, very efficient zone. So like they're scoring, they're, they're high. Again, they have the highest percentage of efficiency for shots. They have the highest amount of shots. They have very low goal scoring shots, which they don't they don't care about. Um, but if, right now, if you were to take, with respect to Gawag, Kenny, Tipperary, Waterford, line them all up and say, right, if they play the Limerick tomorrow, what will be the gap? It's a minimum six points everywhere. And like, I know it's, it's, it's very hard for a goal person to admit that, you know, because as you don't want to admit defeat in any shape or manner, but it's just reality the situation, you know. And like, your only hope is, like my concern, straight up now, and I said this to a friend of mine during the week was, Limerick have, um, they have four out of five years, haven't they? Is yep. that right? Yeah. So, and they're three in a row, yeah? Yeah. So mm-hmm. like, your concern is that they have, a Dublin situation will materialise again, like they had in the football, where they go four, five, and, and you know, God knows after that, you know. Because you're nearly waiting for their players to go, <laughs> to retire, <laughs> just to have enough and say, right, that's it. Because right now it's just, like I said, I mentioned the word ecosystem a while ago. They'll, in, they'll, inter, they'll introduce the youth in, into the system and they'll get coached alongside an already up and running train. And they'll get acclimatised to it all and they'll become part of the whole thing. So it'll be a continuation of the current situation. Like it's just like that's why I say today's hurling is a running game. And when you've got someone like, like an academic like Paul Knurk, who's got a, who's got a PhD in small-sided games, you know, that's what you're dealing with. A PhD. I know, like, 
me, Murph, you, Will, we grew up, let's say, hurling. We grew up with a certain level of coaching. We didn't become a certain level of hurler and have our own ideas about hurling. But we, we, we've never gone to the level that this man has gone to. So that's what we're up against. You know, and it's hard to see how we're going to catch someone like him and his team. Yeah, one of the stats I picked up, Murph, on the 42's uh, review of the game on Sunday, which I thought is remarkable, really. So 2018, these teams met in the league semi-final. Tipperary won after extra time. We know that Limerick picked themselves up after the league and had quite a good year afterwards. But Tipperary won the All-Ireland in 2019 and Limerick have won all the All-Ireland since. So we're talking about the All-Ireland winners since 2018 meeting again this week. And we look back to what happened just before that summer. Tipperary used 22 players on the day in 2018. 16 of them are not involved in the Tipperary panel anymore. Yeah, it's a remarkable stat. Really. Well, like Limerick is pretty much the same core group. Yeah, and I suppose you, I think a lot of that could come down to like just the age profile of a lot of players. Like you look at that that Tipperary team that was playing 2018, a lot of those boys, like you're looking back nearly to that group of players that came through in 2008, nine from the under 21, let's say, um, Paddy Maher and all these lads. And, you know, those group of players were around kind of 2014, 16, 19, that kind of period. Whereas, you know, the, I remember playing Tipperary or Limerick in Nolan Park, I think it was 2017. And these names were starting to come onto the scenes of the Kyle Hayes, Keen Lynch was playing that day, Casey was playing that day, but they were all young men, they're all really young fellas, and they had a really good under 21 team. And that was the core group of that player. So I think what you saw then was, it was remarkable even, like I remember Brian saying it to us back in 2017, after we played him in Nolan Park, John Kiley had said to Brian that, you know, look, in the spirit of sport, he was like, look, you know, we'll meet you again. These boys are really good. And, you know, next time we meet you, we, we could be in a different position. And sure enough, we met them in 2018. So John Kiley always knew what was coming through that, a year or two of blooding with these lads and they're just going to start upping it and upping it and upping it. But it's remarkable that it's to think 16 players in those five years for Tipperary. I mean, it just goes to show you what systems have been happening since. And, you know, the, the, the players leaving dressing was very influential players. And, you know, Limerick have just been building since that time. So it's it's amazing to see where both counties were the last when they, when they met at that time to where they are now. And that... Limerick are really hitting their their peak now, so that's that's alarming for other teams. But it's 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 an amazing stat to read. Let's yeah. keep talking there because I'm currently doing the average age Limerick team here, right? <laughs> that's that's fair enough. So I give Murph the next question then after that because I had a couple of Tipperary fans who messaged me last week because we kind of said towards the end of the chat we weren't quite sure because Garrod O'Connor has been hitting the freeze so well that it's like do you almost default to Jason Ford being your first choice free taker for the championship and they both feel the best decision is for Jason Ford to be hitting the freeze. Now Garrod O'Connor and Jason Ford were both on the pitch at the same time at the weekend. Big game, semi-final in the league. Jason Ford was on the freeze. Struck them well. Got 14 points. 11 from freeze on Saturday. Uh, Garota Connor though scored three from play Alan Tyning got four from play and afterwards Liam Cal was saying Murph that those two players were two of the real finds for him during the league Garota Connor's form and the way that Tynan has shown since he's come back playing Hurling for the county as well they combined for seven points from play between them I thought Tynan in particular was going around like a terrier at different times chasing down the ball as well that's been two real finds for that Tipperary forward line ahead of championship Exactly, yeah. And we go back to the measurables we're talking about for Liam Cal. And, you know, he's coming away from this going, that's brilliant. As a standalone for two groups of, or for two players to go out and contribute in any match, whether it's, you know, a league semi final, whether it's a round robin phase, or whether you're an All Ireland semi final, if you say that two of your forwards are going to go out and contribute with that, you're going to say, brilliant, I'll take that. I don't care who they are, but those are really good contributions and the fact that Jason Ford is a brilliant free taker you know a few weeks ago we talked about um, teams needing that free taker that you know when he stands over a ball that he's just going to put it over Jason Ford is that person and even with the likes of we would have spoke about Tony Kelly do you leave him on the freeze is it a way of getting him into a game sometimes people say that you know having a certain player on the freeze allows them to get on the scoreboard and maybe freeze them up then from normal play but Jason Ford is just such a reliable fella and as I said like, I mean, 14 points is, is, is great contribution um, so it, it's kid look it's, like, it's almost like the conundrum to an extent that Kilkenny have in that you know, you have Drennan there, who's like a robot putting him over but then TJ's coming back you know so I know we'll get to them there later on but call it who's taking the freeze at TJ, I'd say I'll be taking him. Okay. 
I think it's just for a clarity if a TJ will be taking him that's it but even no, though no. like even though Drennan hit them so well like particularly yesterday on airing with his freeze mm, took the brilliant. penalty really well bounced it in before it went in it was perfect penalty technique I'm not for a moment writing off the fact that TJ Reid is one of the best free takers we've ever seen but Drennan mm. has shown what he can do Absolutely, and I think it's good for TJ as well. I mean, I, I don't remember a game where TJ had an off game under freeze in, in definitely in recent memory anyway, but like when I think back to 2012s and that, like we kind of had Henry and Richie Power on the freeze, like, and I didn't know what the format was for who was stepping over him, but they used to just take them. And, you know, the other another day you might have Richie Hogan taking them. So the competition in that you have a few lads pushing really hard for, you know, I don't think that's, TJ would actually enjoy that competition anyway. But again, TJ in himself is like a robot. And I think if Billy Drennan seems to be the type of player that if, if, if TJ comes back in and does take over the freeze, I think that'll be something to focus the mind of Billy to go, OK, even as my standards are exceptionally high, I still have to consistently go week on week and show this even in training, wherever it's going to be with my club, I'm going to consistently keep doing it and earn that mantle of, if you're going to take him off TJ Reid, you know, you have to obviously put in a serious case, but he is, he's a brilliant free taker. And I thought the test of how good he was, was actually in the Waterford match. A really bad day, yeah. the weather. Yeah. And he was brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. And he's so calm. He's so composed when he takes him and he's such a, and he's a young man. Um, yeah, like, I mean, if, if Billy Drennan stands over him in championship, I won't bat an eyelid. But I just think that TJ will just come back in and, onto the freeze because it's that kind of level of experience as well of an experienced hand putting that but mm-hmm. also if you remember good few years ago and I know I'm using <clears> any <throat> references here when DJ and, and Henry were on the scene DJ kind of did a handover to Henry of listen Henry step over that ball and it could be a case of where you know the game is going on TJ's taking freeze Billy might be on the score sheet and TJ goes over and goes put that one over the bar there and implement and brings him into the game so there's lots of things that could happen there but I think TJ will be on the yeah, and not to get away from Drennan, because that's why I'm thinking of him here, Murph. So I was looking up the top scorers in the league earlier today because I was intrigued to see how much he'd actually scored. So he went north of the 70 points of the weekend with the 113. So I think across all the divisions, it's him and Owen Cal who are pretty much neck and neck before the last round to see who's top scorer overall. But he's going to be the top scorer in Division 1 because there's no one in Limerick who's anywhere close to him. Uh, Donald Burke was the only other player who came anywhere close. If you've got this lad contributing, what, 10, 11 points on average throughout the games he's been playing so far in Division One of the Hurling League, has he been like one of the standout finds for any team? I, I, I kind of wonder, why did Cody not make more use of him last year? I suppose, like, what I really stood Billy Dreaded out for me was really the under-20 final last year. He was remarkable in that. Mm. Um, and, yeah, maybe, maybe now people will be saying that maybe Brian could have used him. But maybe like a lot can happen in that year of, you know, maturing as a player. Maybe he just wasn't shown because, you know, Brian was always open, <clears throat> particularly for having these players that you could pick up and slot them in and nobody was expecting. So Brian was always open for doing something like that. And you think back to the Walter Welch in 2012 and all these players, Brian was always open to that. So I would say if they hadn't picked him up, it was maybe just that from, not, from, from normal play, he wasn't maybe contributing as much. And he has had a lot of hurling in that time that has brought him up to standard. But, I mean, if you look at the weekend, 113, he contributed. Uh, like just huge scoring. And he just he's always involved in the play as well. Um, but I, I think maybe over the last 12 months, and particularly even under Derek, because Derek has brought him through into senior, Derek understands him as, as a young player now stepping in and maybe knew how to bring him in. And there's a lot to be said for that in terms of how to in- introduce him into the team. Um, but he absolutely, I mean, even you think over the last five or six years, there probably hasn't been a more um, balanced debut in a league, really. You know, as in we see people, you know, introducing to the league and having a great game and the following week maybe not being great and so on. Consistently, he's been absolutely brilliant for Kenny And probably the player of the league, I can't really think of anyone else who's, you know, completely out, outplayed him. Um, and I, I'm only laughing as well because week on week the GA are putting up the player of the week and he, he's consistently up there as the Kilkenny nomination for player of the week so uh, he's been really good and look again I spoke last week of saying that he's going to be in the Kilkenny 15 he will be in the Kilkenny 15 for championship and having a player that young proving himself in a league and that you're able to say absolutely there's another another player to introduce into that forward yeah. line it's brilliant we bought you enough time scale. What's in the notebook and this average age you were working out there? Uh, the average age of Limerick is 28 at the minute. Mm. That's sick now. I was hoping for 31 or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I can't get over like, like Kyle Hayes 
24, do you know what I mean? Keenan is 26, Tom Morris is 26, Aaron Glenn 26, Flanagan. Flanagan I thought was way older. Mm. So like he's going to come and turn 26. Kyle Hayes is 24, is he? Uh, 24, yeah. Like, Jesus. It's, just, it's sick, like. Do you know? Jesus. <laughs> like, we're just, down about 26, 26. Were, were we just in yeah. the podcast here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> come back in three years' time when a, a new challenger has emerged. Yeah, but like he, the, he, He's 24. He turned 25 this year, like, but he's 24. Yeah. So whatever you want to look at. It. But the scary thing about that is, Cal, like, it, it almost it almost felt like a joke when uh, Gerald Hegarty was coming on as a blood sub and came back off about 50 seconds later during that blood sub. And then yeah, eventually we don't need he you. come on. We don't need you, yeah. Yeah. But like, here we go. The guy who scores the incredible goal in the All-Ireland final, who's turned up in every big game that Limerick have played for the last five years. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll but, ease him in for 10 minutes. But can I just, can I just, I, a question I had when I was watching the game was, I was trying to get into the mind of Kylie and Knurk their thought process when they go no we don't need Flanagan Hayes or Hegarty no we're good we're three or four points down no we're not going to bring on the lads <laughs> like yeah. what are they, what's going through their mind like they obviously, they're, they're obviously looking at the guys in training and they have such I suppose confidence and belief mm-hmm. in what, what they can produce and lo and behold they're fully right but they've been very careful with the minutes as well, Scott. Like, we've been watching this nearly every week when guys Actually, are coming well. in and out. And, like, even it was very noticeable, I thought, the first three or four games, how often when either Hayes or Hegarty came in, they were replacing each other. Correct. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, managing the load, as they call it. Yeah. Because when, when you come down the stretch, like, we won't have a situation in Ireland final where you won't see Hegarty or Hayes, you know. Yeah. They're going to be two absolute pillars of, of that team, as they've, as they've been for the last number of years. So. I expect him to get back in the team. Yeah, but even like that half back line, which picks itself. So now Hayes has effectively had rest for a couple of games in the league. If that's going to be his role, if he's going to play him wing back, yeah. and Declan Hannan, Murph, and also Burns have had limited involvement because they weren't playing early on in the league. So both these guys are coming fresh into the Munster Championship now, two or three games behind them, maybe another league medal. But the fact of it is that no one's been overplayed really. No, exactly. Like, uh, what players really have been consistently on the pitch? Like, Sean Finn didn't start the league, let's say. Tom Morrissey is one fella having a head that's kind of been there and thereabouts consistently. But like you said, they've rotated players quite well, even like Colin Cochran and things as well. Like, they've just rotated players nicely. And I'd say, on the greater scheme of things, if you actually broke down the minutes played, I'd say Limerick have, are well aware of the breakdown of minutes played over the course of the league for the majority of the players. If you were to go for an average, the players have gotten an average time on the pitch. And to go back to the point about you know, Garot Hegarty and the lads. I think John Kelly's mindset would be that we're four points down. If you if you just throw on Garot Hegarty in a match like this, like the league is should be used for situations like this where you're down by four points. Let the team with the, on the pitch deal with it. And if they don't deal with it, then you can address it Monday night or Tuesday night in training to say, you know, lads, like, I mean, not to say we could have brought on Garot Hegarty or, or Kyle Hayes and lads, but if you're putting your hand up for a starting 15 jersey, we're giving you the opportunity here now. And then you can kind of go and let's say talk to individual players and say, look, did you see these points here? You didn't chase your man here. And we played Peter Casey in the other corner. Peter Casey chased his man and he did this and he turned over this ball. That's what we value. So you can actually then use that to reference other players. But I think if you just, like they have an extremely strong team out anyway. But I think if you go down by three or four points and you just wing on the boys, particularly in the league, maybe in championship they'll do it, but just in the league, there's an element there where you could you know, take a bit of confidence away from a player who may just have not gotten into the game yet. And also, you kind of want the team on the pitch also to maybe adapt to what's happening. I mean, you said there yourselves that I think Kinnerk and Kylie said to the lads at halftime, we need to do a small bit of tweaking the tactics. And maybe, you know, spoke to Hannon and so on and allowed the players to figure out, okay, this is how we're going to get around get around Tipperary. But there's lots of lessons for Limerick to actually learn there from adapting on the pitch John Kiley letting the players try and figure this out without having to go right let's get all the big guns on because there's so many lessons to be learned there and if there's anything from a league semi-final to be taken if there's any lessons for Limerick to be learned well there's a few great little lessons for them to go that's brilliant we can bring that forward for championship that players aren't going to panic they know they have the answers on the pitch and that they know that we also believe that they can figure this out yeah maybe the good news for the chasing pack is that the whiteboards and the water breaks are now gone because Kinnerk can't bring them out anymore if he can have such a profound effect at half time imagine what would happen if Limerick could go back to doing so every 20 minutes or so within a game a <laughs> uh, few more questions have come in one that wasn't touched on scale on League Sunday so I'm going to ask both of you about it because this incident didn't uh, get analysed in the TV last night this question's come in from Matthew Price 776 and it's heavily related to this game should Will O'Donoghue have been sent off 
at the start of the match. So I think that's referring to the Willow Donahue incident with Alan Tynan, which has got, I think a lot of people have shared it around uh, the clip online over the last couple of days. Should Willow Donahue have got sent off? And is it likely he's now going to, that incident might be looked at? Um, just my Murph silence, he wants me to go first. I think he asked you. <laughs> I asked you first, yeah. he can come in then. Damn it, I thought you asked me to be judged. No, that's to be judged and executioner here, but I'm sure you've seen the clip. It has been uh, doing the rounds. I, I, I saw the clip, and truthfully, yeah. in real time, I didn't see I, I missed it because your eyes would be attracted to 10 different things going on in that kind of situation. I missed it. Um, so it looks like he tur- there's a bit of schmoz, a bit of flip, pulling, dragging, and it's like he turns around in a clockwise direction and kind of pushes the hurl into your man's helmet. Is that right? Is that fair? Or is he hitting? Yeah, push Certainly, his. it's your interpretation of it. Go yeah, on. Yeah, it's your interpretation, yeah. Well, either way, the, the hurl hits the helmet, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And he hits him, he hits him in the ear. Yeah. Like, that, that's a striking action, I'm sorry. Like, if, if I'm going to hold my hand up and say, Dave Fitzgerald des- deserved a red card last week, which in my view he did, and Owen Downey got a red card for a strike action, which in my, in my view it's a red card, the same applies to Will. You know, he's mm-hmm. a great player in that particular incident. Like, that's by the letter of the law. And like, is he intending just to just to tickle him and get him away from him? No, he's intending to hit him to get him away from him, you know. So it's strike action. So I'm, it's it's a red for me. Like, and again, you could have a similar situation whereby you see a retrospective ban introduced. Well, given as well, Skell, and Murph, I'll get your view on it in a second, but given that they already looked at the Kyle Hayes incident a few weeks back ago in Salt Hill and a retrospective ban was handed out for that one, it means if they start looking into that, they have to probably look at this Willow Donahue one. Precedence, yeah. Yeah. Murph, your take? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think it's a red card as well. Um, not that I have any sort of, again, not that you explain yourself or say you don't have an agenda against Limerick or Kilkenny are playing them. I just think it's consistency again, you know. Um, look, it, not that we go to the letter of the law and we're trying to dilute the game down or anything, but it's almost like you see similar things in rugby now where there's rules implemented to protect players against, you know, head injuries and different things. And even the face guard and hurling is another one. I mean, it opened the helmet from Thailand as well. Like, you know, it was, it was a sizable enough strike. Um Look, Willow Dunn, who is a physical player, and geez, I love watching him play, and he, he he's great for, I suppose, getting involved in rucks and coming out with the ball, but that was a rush of blood to the head, and similar enough with Downey in the Cork match, it was a rush of blood, and I think the likes of Dunn, who and Downey would regret doing something like that, going, you know, it's a silly thing that if I could have been sent off at the time, but I think retrospectively, if the GAA go back and look at it, they have to go, yeah, we, well, it's it, like that. If you read it out, it's a striking action to the head. Mm-hmm. It's careless use of the hurl. You know, it's, it's, it's most likely a red card, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Skell, let's give you the outsider perspective because Murph was at the game between Kilkenny and Cork and this has been described as a, a six-point hammering. Uh, Cork yeah. actually managed, to, I think, to draw level during the time that they were down to 14 men. But for me, watching the game in TG Carr yesterday afternoon, I think Kilkenny looked really, really comfortable throughout against Cork. I, did Cork even show up here, Skell? Um, in very, very small phases, right? There was kind of, <clears throat> I suppose glimpses that's the word I use glimpses of good play I thought Shane Barrett was doing well on the wing in the first half I thought he was I, I was actually commenting live that he's filling in well for Robbie O'Flynn here I think this is a good guy who can who can make it work power get on a good bit of ball and give him Tommy Wands a bit of hassle I thought he could have taken on more in goals um, I just thought Cork was, was kind of messy you know kind of sloppy um, there are puck outs to say and just, I know Patrick Collins is a great goalie like made a great save but I don't think he'd be overly happy with his general performance the puck outs um, because it gave Kikini a good platform to go at them, and like he's a super keeper, like but just it, it it seemed like there was no, they were they were void of a plan, you know. It was kind of, it was a messy kind of game too, if you know what I mean. Like the at the, at the end of the game, I think the score was one ten to ten from play, something like that, you know, which is not exactly setting the world alight. Just there was a lot of frees. Granted, there were frees, but again, the car the car tackling tackling was questionable. I don't think they can argue around the frees. But Adrian was superb in the way he was hitting them. I just felt Kikini were. Oh, you know, they were in cruise control to be honest I know after the red card they managed the game really well like it finished 8-8 after that point but it always got the sense that Kilkenny could have scored a goal or two if they really went for it to just close the game out um, it was a good victory the margin of, of victory is fair I can't even if there was 15 on 15 at the end, at the end I still think the margin would be the same um, just Kilkenny's tackling their defence I thought was really good like the, the, they're, they're ferocious tacklers um, and working the ball out they still have work to do don't get me wrong they're still a touching loose when you when you draw, compare them to the Olympics of this world and, and look we'll see that in a couple of weeks time how, how that stood up but again you play out in front of you they manage Cork fierce well I was expecting more of Cork to be honest I was kind of pumping them up this time last week in fairness and I got disappointed 
So shame on me. <laughs> so shame on them. I don't know what it is, but I was expecting, like, I actually thought Cork would come to Dolan Park, throw in a real heavy handed performance, let's say, on the back of a good league and challenge Kilkenny. And, and I, I was given a good chance to come away with a win. You know, and they didn't. They, 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 they flattered to deceive again. Yep. I'm I'm with you entirely because my thought in this Murph ahead of it was that what we saw from Tip, particularly in the first half against Limerick on Saturday, is what I expected from Cork against Kilkenny because they're going into a game where they know they're not going to play Kilkenny until after the provincial championship if both teams were to qualify. So it's a really good chance to have a good cut at this piece of silver will be good for Cork. Get back into a league final for the second year in a row. Lots of these players we talk about managing minutes. Cork have been using nearly two different teams throughout the league, so therefore everyone should have been primed for the semi-final I thought they were going to be hungry I thought they were going to be physical I thought they were going to track everything down they were going to get turnovers and I thought it was a reasonably limp performance overall yeah it was it was very lackadaisical really the whole thing from, from Cork like that now like last week I, I wasn't trying to play down to Kenny by saying I thought they were underdogs going into it I knew they had a few injuries no more than Cork had a few injuries but just thought that Cork consistently throughout the league which is a fair statement had just performed that bit better and when they really performed they looked really well and like that, I thought Cork coming up to Kilkenny would go, yeah, like this is a great chance for us to take a scalp off Kilkenny here now and prepare for a championship with a, with a good mental win as well. Like, you know, going to Nolan Park and performing. And, you know, there was just so many, there were so many things you could point to with the Cork performance. Like Kilkenny settled in really quickly, you know, got a few points on the board. And I thought, OK, Cork, we're going to settle here now and they'll get into the game. Uh, and they just never did. They never got that bit of traction. They kind of threatened goal once with Owen Murphy. They, they, they shot the ball over the bar. But even at that, it wasn't a blatant goal opportunity. Um, but even coming down the home straight there, okay, they went down to 14. But they kind of had that, that, that thing of where a team goes down to 14, they kind of up it a small bit and they start to get to grips with it. And Kilkenny generally were five points up for the last 10 minutes or so. You know, it, it obviously fluctuated at times, but there were generally five points up and Cork hit a few whites. They probably hit four or five whites in the last 10 or 15 minutes. That If they put over three of those, suddenly now it was down to maybe three or two points and Kilkenny are now kind of getting a bit worried going, well, we have the extra man here, you know, and it gets a bit cagey then. But Cork didn't even bring it to that. Kilkenny just kept them at arm's distance and not even overly playing savagely well Kilkenny. Like Kilkenny themselves hit a few wides, dropped a few balls, shortened to Collins. So Kilkenny will be looking at that going, you know, we won by six points, but we probably left another five or six points behind us uh, when we went a man up. So there's a few things that Kilkenny will certainly look at, but Cork, you know, Cork have to look at themselves in the mirror in this one and say, like, even with a an, an, not a full strength Kilkenny team without your own Cody's, Adrian Mullins and these lads, you know, Kilkenny still just bullied them, implemented their game plan, got two goals and, you know, probably won the mental battle on the day, really. Like, you know, so there's lots of things that Cork would want to forget about the weekend, but it was a missed opportunity for them to come up and cement everything they've been doing really well in the league and that we've been praising them for. But they took, a, I think they took a backward step a small bit at the weekend because that's their last game now before the round robin. And instead of going out, maybe at least dying on your shield, they just kind of went out in a whimper, really. Yeah. Like the moment for me that kind of summed it up, Murph, was towards the end of the game. Now, Kilkenny were going to get the victory. There were a couple of goals up at the time, but the ball comes out at one stage. It's pucked out short to Joyce and he overcarries the ball because there was actually no movement in front of him whatsoever. And you could see his frustration when he dropped the ball down. He yeah. overcarries it because he's actually trying to look up to see someone who's free we, we and there's no this, pass on. Do you remember mm. the Muslim Championship Lone Park last year? The first round, Cork and mm. we yeah. covered the exact. We covered the exact same thing. We said that there was no the reason the cork backs were holding the ball for so long because there's nothing going up front. Yeah. So it's a repeat of what happened this time last year. Do what you always do, get what you always got. Do you know what I mean? That's mm. the, the situation with Cork at the minute. Like, yeah. uh, do, would it, do you think it would set them backwards? It, it'd be interesting to see. Like if you look at Watford and, and Cork a, in Walsh Park last year, that was where the wheels came off the wagon for, for Watford. Now, Watford. I'm not saying yeah. that this is the wheels coming off the wagon for Cork, but they have to go back there now and you know, tomorrow night or tonight or whenever they're training and sit down and go, right, lads, we're putting that to one side. These are the points and address it. Like, you know, say that that's not good enough. You know, and that won't win us. If we have any plans to go and ideally win in all Ireland and play whoever in the final and we're going to have to top a Limerick doing that, no doubt, you know, that's, that's never going to win you in all Ireland. And you can't be saying that the excuse is that you know, maybe we're caught in a hot play in Kilkenny and that Kilkenny at times were good in the league and at times, you know, maybe weren't so good. That's not good enough. If you're going to go out and win these things, win Munster Championships, win All-Irelands, 
you win them on your own terms and you do that without taking a backward step really yeah. in that time. So I don't think the wheels have come off the wagon for Cork, but they much would have they would have rather finish on a more positive note than the weekend it is. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. It it changes the impression, doesn't it, Scal, when we look at how well they played throughout one A, that come back against Limerick. There's lots of good things that the Cork management can take into championship, but the way they performed on Sunday just kind of takes the gloss off it a little bit. It does. Like, like, like last week, do you know, when I was picking a team, of the, a team of the league at the time, now when I was pretty mature, I was kind of going with themselves in Tipperary, to be honest. Mm. And like, oh, that's why I'm so surprised because I thought, you know, are, the questions I asked myself, are, have they a good squad? Yes. Ha, what's the age profile like? Good. Have they a good management? Yes. Um, ha, ha, have they been battle hardened? Yes. You'd have to say they are because they came through a tough group. So all that points towards go down to Nolan Park and, and get the victory because they went away to Innes, came away with a draw with a young team, went away to Galway, came away with a victory, beaten Limerick. So you're saying, this is all, all signs are pointing to, to a positive outcome. And that's why it just it was like letting the air out of the balloon. It just, you know, it just petered out, which is which is very disappointing, you know. And the game was over as a contest when when, uh, when Andrani got sent off. You just knew that the, the, the fight wasn't there. And you can tell, like, you can tell when the fight isn't there. Do you know what I mean? On a team, by looking at them and... I just thought second half, five or ten minutes gone. This is over. It's game over. Murph, Jackie Terrell was talking last night about how kind of we're starting to see the evolution of Kilkenny. There's still quite a few very important players to come back in um, ahead of championship as well. But under Derek Ling, and you've had a chance now to see him a few times, and this was maybe seen a bit closer to the championship team uh, on Sunday afternoon in Olin Park. But I don't know. I think there's still elements here of what of the Kilkenny of old as well. Like I think back to the goal, which is a very effective diagonal ball that comes in. And if you've got a big man in around the square, that can still be effective. Sometimes they go for short stick passing. Sometimes their approach out from the goal is a little bit short. Sometimes they'll go a bit longer. Are we seeing a defined pattern or are we seeing a Kilkenny team right now who can maybe mix it a bit? Yeah, they're definitely trying to mix it. Uh, and something I was encouraged about at the weekend, you know, the, pre- the week previously, I was maybe pointing towards uh, Kilkenny maybe striking one or two long balls, forcing the issue a small bit. But I could see what, what they were at this weekend with Cork. And Cork kind of bought it to a degree. Like Kilkenny, when they had the puck out, Cork didn't sit back or they didn't push up. They kind of just condensed the middle third. So Kilkenny usually took a short puck out carried it up and then just poked it in over all those people in the middle third onto, you know, Mossy Kyo and Billy Drennan and these lads. And then, it, it, you know, some, sometimes it translated into a score or so on. But that was kind of the platform. So Kenny were looking to see what do Cork want to do. And Cork committed, it appeared to be, to condense that middle third and say, well, we're not going to let Kenny run through it. And Kenny went, fine, we're going to carry it up to the 45 and then we're going to poke it over your head and, you know, put the onus on those players to go and win it. Now, they did vary it up and they carried the ball up once the space then started to appear to Kenny start carrying the ball up. They're still perfecting it. I don't think, you know, they've really nailed it down at this stage. And particularly, I saw a few times and it was probably hard to see on, on the telly. But when you were there at the game, you could see that Kenny will want to, they look back at the game and say, well, when we, when we went, a man, went a man up, we had an extra player on the pitch, but did we use them as much as we could have? You'd have to say probably not because at times I saw Kenny going down the right side and the extra man was over on the left side. If you look at Limerick and Tip, Dermot Burns at one stage was over the right side, saw a cul-de-sac and spread it out to the left-hand side when it was 15 on 15. So I think Kenny will look at that, which is a great positive to bring forward even after winning with six points. It's going, right, lads, if we have the extra man, let's use him and let's put the pressure on the opposition to now make their 14 players work as hard as they can. Because... For me, that's where I think that Kilkenny missed a small bit of a trick. Now, never mind. They were always comfortable. They seemed to be just comfortable finishing up. But they're still perfecting that game. And I was really happy with what they were doing because something that I think they're going to do going against Limerick now, and I know we'll speak about it next week, is they they, they trusted the full back line to go toe-to-toe with the Cork full forward line and win the foot race. And like <clears throat> at the start, it was really good where uh, there was a lot of space in front of the Kilkenny full back line. But it was, you know, Park Walsh, Tommy Walsh and Mikey Butler three lads that had no problem with going in a foot race and the ball came down and I think it was Kingston and Porrick were running for it and Porrick was like a savage now he was a, a yard behind him but he was running as hard as he could and he got the flick and he got the flick and it went out for a line ball and the Kilkenny crowd reacted and Porrick was ready for it and he wanted to go for that ball so it wasn't that the full back line were exposed. It looked like the Kilkenny were going, lads, listen, we're going to condense it here. Boys, we trust you enough to go and and go man for man with these lads. And I think that was an indication as to what they'll do against Limerick, that they're going to trust these lads to go. There's all a run in there in that full back line. 
great hurling. Park Welch is one of the best hurlers in the country. There's, there's also the hurling to back that up. So I think there was indications to see that what they were preparing for and potentially now playing against Limerick, that they're going to go with the same system that will trust the full back line um, and that they're going to try and maybe condense that middle third that we always talk about. I know lots of teams are trying to do it, but those were the few things I took from, from the weekend. Skell, someone kind of half finished your job from last week. Remember you wanted very specifically who was going to be 8-15 to 15, and the reason for your question was does Billy Drennan make the team come championship yeah. was the reason Wrong why. Vote. Yeah, well, RN80 has gone and pretty much finished the job. We'll do the full back line at some point, but the question he's brought in is assuming Richie Reid is a definite number six for Kilkenny when he comes back, who will play at five and seven? So take the assumption first, Murph, that it is going to be Richie Reid and Hugh Lawler goes from six back to three once he's uh, back in the team. Who plays for Kilkenny at five and seven if Richie Reid is the six? Uh, first of all, is Richie Reid six? Uh, I knew you'd do that, yeah. Skell. That's why he said assuming, but go on. I know he is. Yeah, yeah, he, he is. Like, Hugh Lawler is brilliant. And what, 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 what could also happen as well, even looking at it, Kenny had an enormous half-back line at the weekend, and it was brilliant to see it. They had three <laughs> boys that were about six foot four, like Blanchfield and Corcoran, they're six foot five. Huey Lawler is six three, six four. Enormously physically player, uh, physical players. And they had a great game. The half-back line were really good. And they fought really hard for ball. You know, we we, took, we spoke last week of the likes of John Donnelly or Walter Walsh and what they would bring to and why you might pick one player over another. The, similar enough with Richie Reid and the likes of Hugh Lawler. You know, if you were deciding to yourself that, you know, we're going to go with a bit, a bit more physicality at, cent- at centre-back, maybe Hugh Lawler goes there and Richie Reid, who's very much a playmaker and uses the ball really well and gets the head up and finds drifts along that half-back line, maybe he does that. So I think we, we said it with Tipperary. We said, you know, the moving around of Breen um, of Maher and lads so I think we've seen another element there that Derek Ling has come away going that, well, that's great but I do think Richie Reid will be centre back I think he'll be centre back for championship Huey Lawler has been exceptional at full back again the physicality he brings to that position and driving out with the ball as well so Hugh had a great game at the weekend but I still don't think he's dislodged Richie because Richie's a really good player and you have to have him somewhere in the team that's not to say though you don't pop him out to wing back if you feel that that's what's required so who are the two wing backs beside him then? Oh, that's a tough one. Now, if you if 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 Richie is centre back, I think you're probably going with you could be going with Buckley and Blanchfield potentially. Or see, this is the thing. Like Corcoran was exceptional. The two boys are carbon copies, Blanchfield and, and Corcoran. They're they're big men, well able to move and have enormous hurling. I think Blanchfield's a great player as well. Um he he wins a lot of dirty ball and you know, if you're thinking of a player that you're going to put on Garrod Hegarty at some stage and go running with him or a Kyle Hayes, you, you, you'd probably prefer to have that physicality and that bit of size go and matching him. I would find the half back line very hard to pick for Kenny at the moment. I, I'd probably say at the moment, going just by performance, probably Buckley at, at right half back and a toss up between Blanchfield or Corcoran and the other wing back line. It's, it's very tight at the moment because neither Blanchfield or Corcoran have done anything really wrong not to be in the team and they both kind of bring very similar attributes to that position uh, and Buckley has huge run in him enormous amount of run in him as well that can kind of provide let's say if you want to compare it to a Barry Nash type thing of running up and down those channels and supporting players I think Kenny will struggle you know you're going to have a player sitting on the bench there that's going to be going to be very disappointed championship if I say it now I'd say Buckley Richie Reid and Blanchfield at the moment Settlet scale who would you pick? <laughs> I'll take less than 10 minutes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're a great lad, aren't you? You'll get in an American football reference, though, I'm sure, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> We're two defensive ends. Um, I... Ooh, who would I go with? The clock is on me now. All I can hear is the countdown music in, in my head now. <laughs> you put the pressure you on yourself by saying 10 minutes. <laughs> Eight and a half minutes left. Go on. Uh, Blanchfield is playing for me, anyway. Uh, Blanchfield is playing at five, though. For me... Um, yeah, I like Park Walsh in the halfback line, but again, that's just me. He's like Kilkenny, like, Kilkenny seem to like him everywhere, but in the halfback line the last yeah, year. Yeah, I like I like him. I like him at wing back, but again, you know, will he be there wing back? No, the, the, probably the, it looks like he won't. Um, it's hard to tell. Fuck, sorry, <laughs> it's okay. You're allowed for. Probably, so. I, I was trying to go against the green a bit. It's probably the same halfback line as Murph. To be honest. Ah. Well, I know it's boring I know I get that I get that but again when you're trying to think of 
I'm not going to put one on my hole. It's just that <laughs> when you think of what Derek Ling is going to do, or you have an assumption what he's going to do, I don't see Parik Walsh in the halfback line at all. Um, I, th- I think Killian Buckley would, would, yeah, midfield. Jesus. I'm going to go with Murphs. I'm going to go with Murphs. Nice. Yeah, play it safe. And then you went with me. I'm going to play it safe. <laughs> yeah, but I've done in 60 seconds. <laughs> um, the question with the red card because uh, this has uh, come up in two different ways. So first of all, Murph, you were there. Mm. Uh, Downey's red card, because last night, uh, both Dowling and Tyrrell were asked about it in the TV, and for various different reasons, in Dowling's case, because it wasn't clear on the TV footage which was shown, and in the case of Jackie Tyrrell, he said he was in the other stand, so it was very difficult to see. What was your view, and do you think it was a red card? Yeah, I think it was a red card. Um, again, I saw what... Seem uh, any video footage seems to be out there, and uh, look, it, it does seem inconclusive on video footage. But I remember seeing, I was looking directly at it when it happened. Um, so when the scuffle broke out, there was two Kilkenny lads and two Cork lads. Downey and Massey Keown were two, were two of the players anyway. And Downey kind of stabbed the hurl at Massey Keown below the waist, basically. You know, he went for maybe a stab in the balls, like, but he stabbed him anyway with the hurl. And straight away, I was sitting right in front of where it happened, just back up a good few rows. And our whole section reacted. Everybody saw it. And there was a, a couple from Cork were sitting beside me. And your man turned to me and went, oh, geez, if they saw that, he's gone. You know, it was it was very obvious when it happened. Uh, and what happened then afterwards, the umpire looked down the other end because I was looking, linesman, the referee, very hard for them to see it because there was a lot happening. Hmm. The umpire is down the far end. I, both of them, I think, put up the hand and they both saw it. And what happened then was you saw Cahalan and the boys and, and Downey going retreating back in towards the 16-yard box, I suppose. Bounce. No one, no one ca- cards, <laughs> cards were about to ensue. They, they disappeared back in. And I remember seeing it, I think it was Cahalan looked and saw there's a hand up here now. And they started kind of remonstrating <laughs> with the umpires. And the umpires, in fairness to them, stood their ground. And I'd say there was a few swear words, a few skills, choice words were used. But you could see what the umpire was telling the referee. It was, you know, you knew he saw what we saw. And I think, you know, when you see Downey, Downey didn't protest either. And oh. if it was a case where lads were saying, I know a lot of lads are going that it feels like that he picked out one player. He didn't. He was told, he was given very reliable information. The referee, the referee didn't see it, but he was told what had happened. And when he got the red card, everybody around me went, yeah, he was, yeah, he, you know, that was justified. So, look, I'd, I'd appreciate the lads may not have seen it and the television wasn't clear, but from where I was sitting, I said, if that's not a send enough, he's gotten severely out of jail because it was a, it was a dirty enough stroke. Well, the one you can tackle on this one, Scale, is the question which has come in about uh, the nature of the suspensions now carrying from the league into the championships. So, question come in from Garrod Og. Opinions on Pat Ryan's comments saying that league red cards shouldn't carry into the championship. So, this is going to be an issue for Clare with Fitzgerald, potentially with Willow Donahue for Limerick, and now also for Downey. It looks like Cork are going to be without their fullback for the first round of the Munster Championship. Do you think the suspension should go, as Pat Ryan was indicating yesterday, from league to next year's league? Or do you think it's fair enough that the suspension carries from the league directly into the championship? I think there has to be some kind of, I hate to use the word punishment, but at least some sort of penalty for, for an action that deserves a red card, and that's the next game. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm personally in favour of keeping it in the calendar year. I don't. I think if when you, I think you really dilute it when you when you transfer it over to next year's league. Um, I don't agree with that at all because there'll be there'll be blue murder. <laughs> you know what I mean? In some games, you know what I mean. Um, games can, can easily get out of control if you knew you were finishing up. But no, for me, it's it's keep the league. Um, keep the, keep the, keep the, if you get really carried the league, it transfers onto the championship or transfers onto the next game. Excuse me. Um, I wouldn't change that. And I understand where Pat Ryan's coming from. You probably, but the thing is. He's the manager of a player that's just got sent off. He knows he's missing with the Munster Championship. He's probably a touch disappointed or sore about it and will try and plead the case. Like, any, like I, I would do the same thing myself if I was in his position. I'd be saying to get rid of the red card and put it on to next year as well. But no, for me, it's it's keep it. Like, and look, as a guy who wasn't at the game, I would, like, again, it was Massey Keown. You know, as a male, right, when you get that dig, it's an instant, like it's an instant reaction. You haven't even time to think about it. It's an instant reaction. So the minute he reacted, I said, yeah, He's after getting the dig, <laughs> you know, straight away yeah. because you just know as a male when someone goes near that area with a hurl, which should never be done, like that's that's a sore one, that's a sore dose, and you can't, you can't like, if you've got a box in the stomach, right? There's a strong chance you'll be able to take it and keep your posture, but if you get even the slightest tap down there, it's just you, you're 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 down. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know what it is about red cards for digs in that area at Nolan Park. Should we had the same last year with Ozzy Gleason's red card? which was mm. utter stupidity down the other end, which was a semi-final, which Waterford were were winning by a country mile at the time. Um, I Chag, knew well... Didn't Chag get an offer one a couple of years ago, Mark? 
Chad got one off uh, Tom Kenny, I think it was. Mm. Cork. Not to, I, I think it was around 2007. Uh, seven or eight. Was it a oh, you yeah, stretched it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it was basically, it was, it was down around the 45 in Cork Park. Uh, it was a Cork player anyway. I, 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 I think it was Tom Kenny, but it could be wrong. But it was the hurl came up and it was the corner of the hurl straight up. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a sore one. But Chad was stretched it off after that one, yeah. I, I immediately I immediately feel the pain in my stomach. It goes up to my stomach. <laughs> I can just feel it. Do you know when a plane, you know, you know plane comes down fast? You know what I mean? Whatever. You, get, you get that stomach feel. That's what I have right now. <laughs> um, Luca Tani on the Instagram questions. One for you, Murph. Uh, does Paul think Richie Hogan can make it into Kilkenny's starting 15 this season? So, Richie Hogan, this is probably the great surprise the money would have gotten Friday when they looked through the team and saw he was named to start. First time in two and a half years. We were only talking last year about the lack of minutes that Richie Hogan was getting. Um, do you think Richie Hogan, your clubman, can force his way into Kilkenny's starting 15 for championship yeah he could um, I think the conditions in which it, it would go on would be you know again if Derek saw that his impact coming on we, we saw the impact at the weekend 40 seconds in he put a ball over the bar the next ball he got he set up uh, David Blanchfield for uh, well he basically hopped it out to him in space and Blanchfield got a free off it over and he set up I think John Donnelly for the next one so like he brought players into the game because I was keeping an eye on it because I wanted to see obviously like what impact was he going to have not just on the scoreboard but in terms of bringing players around him because one thing I thought going into the weekend was that if he starts centre forward I didn't think he'd start corner forward anyway I thought you know Derek would want him out around the middle getting on ball and if he steps out will Kieran Joyce go with him and that's a problem for a centre back that if he wants to sit back a small bit yeah. do I go with him mm -hmm. and Richie straight away out to midfield got the ball over the bar and I think Derek would look at that and go yeah you know if, if it comes to championship here now I can guarantee Richie will get into a game straight away particularly if we give him space around the middle of the pitch will Richie go 70 minutes hard to know with the injuries he, you know he's 35 this year now you know being realistic that's something that the strength and conditioning staff and, and, and Richie and these lads will have to say you know do I feel I can go but he doesn't have to go to 70 minutes but if he goes and gives 40 minutes there for Kenny brings a good few players into the play gets a point or two and that's the function he serves by starting happy days so he definitely can work his way into a starting position um, but again it's the needs it's what Derek will need on the day that he'll decide do I have Richie Hogan or do I not? If you look at other players, like, you know, like Colin Boyle there for, for Mayo, for example, not to go off on a complete tangent, but mm -hmm. there was a phase there where he'd run himself into the ground and cover about 10K in 40 minutes and Mayo was like religiously Mayo used to take him off after yeah. 45 minutes and he could be flying it and they take yeah. him off. But GPS. that's what they had him on. The GPS hit the 10K and that was it. So I do think he could work his way into a starting position um, and it goes back to whatever Derek needs on the day. That's what he'll pick. Yeah, we've got some other questions which we'll get through in a few minutes, but the other games of the weekend had big significance as well. Uh, Westmead staying up in the end. Uh, they had a difficult campaign in Division 1A. There's going to be a split for next season, so I think Westmead go into 1B for next year with the way it's shaping up after the final results. Uh, so maybe that might help them with a promoted team in there as well. Uh, but Westmead coming through against Leash in Semple Stadium, Again, it's a pity it was there because only about 300 people who actually went to the game. It was being streamed on TG Car as well, but the venue didn't help for either county, I don't think, on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock. But Westmead eventually coming through against Leash, 324 to 126. The returning Killian Doyle scoring 11 points. He enjoys playing at Thurless. Uh, goals in the first half from Joey Boyle and also from Niall O'Brien. Owen Keyes got the crucial score, lads. It came seven minutes from time. So at that stage, it was Westmead 219, Leash 25 points. I was kind of glued to that and trying to keep an eye on what was happening in the Offaly versus Kerry game at the same time. But it, it had turned the pattern around because I kind of was possibly watching the first half when I was in at Offaly against Kerry. And Leash, after 12 minutes, were ahead by five points. They were up by eight points to three. And then slowly but surely, Westmead got back into the game and Leash were putting over good long range points and Picky Mara was very good on the freeze. But then the O'Brien and Boyle goals got Westmead just in front of half time. So it was 210 to 15. But Leash kind of came back into it in the second half. And I felt like this is a game that's probably going to go to extra time up until the point the Keys got that goal. So they were level after 63. And then Westmead nudged in front. Westmead then reeled off a few scores. Ender Rowland comes up bangs in a goal from a free and you're starting to think it's going to be a grandstand finish and then Killian Doyle goes off and who comes on but a guy who I saw added to the panel just before the game started in Derek McNicholas who we spoke to on the pod last year 
kind of said probably going to be my last year became a dad back around Christmas time stepped away from the panel feeling seemed to be maybe that's the end of Derek McNicholas's story he's been around for 20 seasons he's going to take a break away no the longest serving current intercounty senior player is back uh, he was doing his leave insert back in 2003 when he first came into the panel was full part of the panel in 2004 for his first campaign Derek McNicholas got three touches of the ball after he came on lads he scored two points Pretty much ensured that the victory was going to be there for Westmead, uh, despite a little bit of a scare after the rolling goal. So after all that, Murph, Westmead stay in the top flight. And for Leash, finally caught up with them. Ten years of battling, and for the best part, battling in all of those years to stay up. Their decade in the first division has come to an end. Yeah, it's remarkable. And it was a tough one to call last week when we were looking at it from the outset. But it's amazing how fine a margin these teams can come down to. And the bit of momentum at different time periods in the game. And, you know, McNicholas could have came on there and if he came on and found it hard to even get on a ball or even get into the game, that would have could have just been the nature of, you know, coming on at that stage and trying to get yourself in. But two vital scores, three vital touches. Um, and it's amazing that it comes down to the fine margins. But look, unfortunately for Leash, look, I've been involved with my own club and we've dice with relegation a few years and a few years ago we did get relegated. Like, unfortunately, when you're playing with fire like this year and year, sometimes it just catches up with you. Um, fair play to Westmead, you know, they got the breaks and they needed to get them during the game and and th- even when Leash were rallying, they, you know, they still stood up to him. But, you know, credit to them. Um, I'm sure they'll be delighted to be, not to say getting out of jail, but, you know, can live live to fight another year. But, mm-hmm. yeah, unfortunately for Leach with all their great hurlers, look, it just, they've had their good days winning these matches before, but look, it just wasn't to be their day over the weekend. Yeah, and like for Westmead now, this is going to be a couple of seasons back up in the top flight. They're playing the Leinster Senior Championship again after winning the Joe McDonough last year, like the year before. So that to look forward after staying up. That's the important thing for sustained success scale is that this is going to be three seasons in a row where they're going to be getting good quality hurling in championship and league one after another. So staying up there was so important for them. Well, staying up is important, obviously. Um, There's a number of reasons why staying up, obviously for the current group, um, like justification for the refs, you could say, even for the management also. Um, But I I suppose my mind will shift towards the future, you know, from a youth perspective. Um, Because obviously clubs are doing great work in every county. Like when when you pick up a minor player, like the the player you get is 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 a part of the club, you know, and then where he goes from thereafter is a mixture of club and county. So I'm interested to see how like Westmead and and Leash these counties they take their young players and move them forward. I.e. the Leash team of last year, Offaly team of last year, etc. And Westmead they're kind of quiet in that front to be honest. Like well, the very few the very few senior clubs, well, very few yeah. senior clubs that compete against each other as well. So, like the last decade has been dominated by Raharney, Clonkill, and Castletown Gagan. Um, mm-hmm. Lachlan Gales are providing some players onto that senior team, and other clubs around the county as well. But for the best part, there's three clubs who've been remarkably successful for the last while. So they're picking from a small core group there, which is very hard for future. Mm-hmm. Like, how, how do you expect? So basically, you're joining. Theoretically speaking, you're joining a few clubs together. And, and not expecting them, but asking them to, to stay up in a top division where you've got a county like, you know, Galway, for example, where we've, we've 30 clubs, 40 clubs, whatever it is. You know. So that, that's feeding into our system. Same long Kinney, you've got 24 or you know, or, or 30 top clubs feeding into into that team. So it's, it's hard for counties to maintain the status. That's why it's admirable on that behalf that they're, you know, they're, they're, first of all, they're maintaining it. And second of all, they're maintaining it from, like, uh, from a long period. And I, I know we spoke about Leash and the S is 10 years at the top this, that's that's has come to an end but it's not down the drain like it's it's 10 years and there's good work being done in, in both counties so like it's clearly it's credit for one another county gets knocked back but they just have to keep stay with the course and keep at it Hurling needs it like Hurling, we need it not even as competitors we need these counties to keep at it and at it and at it from underage all the way up ultimately we don't want a situation whereby you see what can I give you an example of the sport um, rugby you know, look at the IRB world rankings. You know what I mean? There's there's ten teams there, and I'd say not one of them has dropped out of the ten t- top ten in the last twenty years. You know, mm-hmm. we don't like we want new teams coming up. Let's say and the only way to do that is is through uh, is through youth. And I, we covered this a couple of weeks ago. And if I go off on a tangent again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> youth and finance and starting from from grassroots clubs and getting getting more kids playing the game and keeping them. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think Leash have every chance to win the jump in the cup. I think I'd probably still make them favourites to win it, but it's a difficult thing when you're okay. trying to reset your mindset by comparison to say, like, right, we'll talk about Offaly in a moment about the Offaly-Kildare game, but say if Offaly were to beat Kildare this Sunday and they get promoted and they've had 
eight weeks on beating in a row and they've got a right head of steam going into the first game it's very different to a leash team who've been scrapping away in division 1b and getting negative results and Willie Marr, their manager, who has managed at a high level, like he's been involved with Tipperary teams, with Kula, yeah. with Waterford. So he knows the crack with what's required at the top level if Leash are to close the gap. And he mentioned a couple of weeks ago that it's like they've got good hurlers, but athletically they're behind at the moment some of the other teams. And for Leash, there was always this feeling, Murph, that when they beat Dublin in 2019 and got to a quarterfinal of the championship, that that was going to be the platform for more success after that. But the success hasn't been sustained. And even when Cheddar Plunkett was leaving last year, he was saying that it was probably going to be another season of scrapping to stay up after they went down in the championship following their defeat against Westmead and Leinster. So Leash have been trending downwards for a couple of years. Westmead have been trending the other direction. I think Antrim have been trending the other direction. For Leash now, the important thing for them, I think, is consolidate, have a good Joe McDonough campaign this season, and then face Division 2A the right way next year and try and get back up. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it was great in 2019 when, when Leash did get to the quarterfinal, but that's a very lofty bar to try and get to every year for a team, you know, like Leash, who absolutely have quality players, but it's no mean feat to get to an All Ireland quarterfinal. So to sustain that, or, or potentially, I know they have taken to an extent backward steps, and this is this is one of them. Um, but you have to look at the, the markers for, let's say, Leash in terms of club level. Um, and in terms of, you know, what's coming through at those levels, there is indicators there to say they're headed in the right direction, but you can't, I suppose, expect every year to be an All-Ireland quarterfinal and, you know, have all those great days in Crow Park where you're playing Tipperary. Unfortunately, you also don't want it to be a case where you're getting relegated either. But nevertheless, that's the nature of it. And I know I'd agree with you in what you're saying that, you know, where Leash are coming into this situation now, not saying at all that they'd be, you know, there'd be doubt in themselves about you know, the way that they're playing or anything like that. But there's an element of just the belief, like you're saying, like Offaly or whoever, we're coming in, you know, from, from a real place of like belief that what we're doing, we're on an upward trend and so on. And that there's a lot to be said for that. Um, but it's just a case of, like you said, reconsolidating. Sometimes you have those years and uh, just, I suppose, believing and trusting the process and putting the, 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 the structures in place really that feed into maybe not next year, but three years time, five years time. And as you said, like Willie Murray saying, maybe physically we're not where, where we're at. You know, a year or two years of really good work can, can pay huge dividends as well. So look, there's a few things for, for Leash to pick apart. And um, look, the hurling isn't done, obviously, but there's a few things for them to pick apart for not only this year, but maybe for the for the coming years going forward, even strategically for Leash yeah. as a as a hurling county. I consumed these games in a slightly unusual way at the weekend, lads, because I had to go to an event in Dublin. So I went into the first half of Offaly against Kerry, and then I got onto the train to go to Dublin afterwards. I listened to the end of Offaly and Kerry on the radio, and at the same time with the TG Car stream open to watch Westmead and Leash. And when I left Tullamore at around 20 to 3 on Saturday, as the rain started to open up, I thought there was only going to be one winner in that game. So Kerry were 13 points to 10 up against Offaly in that Division 2A semi-final. Kerry had been so wasteful in front of goal in the first half, but were creating the chances. They missed 12 scoring chances in the first half. So 25 shots of goal, only 13 points when they went in at half time. Offaly were poor and they were really really reliant on Owen Cal's freeze. Now, he ends up top scoring with 13 points. There's 11 frees in the 65 and Dave Nally, I think, put over another sideline cut as well. So that obviously accounted for quite a bit of Offaly's eventual total of 23 points to 19. But Kerry would be kicking themselves because of leaving that lead behind. Offaly changed shirts at halftime. I actually didn't know they'd come back out in white until I saw League Sunday yesterday. I was thinking, what the hell happened there? And there was a deluge of rain. So I'm guessing that's the reason they put the white on. But maybe the white was an inspiration uh, for the second half because Offaly got four of the first five points at the start of the second half, which kind of set the tone for it. And Kerry supporters again were frustrated. But Kerry actually got back into it. 55 gone. Kerry are ahead by 15 points to 14. I think their style, we talked about it a few weeks ago when they played not particularly well with the wind in the reverse fixture in Killarney during the regular section. And then they find themselves 15-14 up and then awfully reel off five points in a row after that. And it never felt like Kerry uh, were actually going to catch them in the final stages. So Kerry would be so frustrated. Two games they probably should have won. They probably should have beaten awfully in the regular section, which may well have put them into the league final straight away. And they'll feel they really left it behind them in the first half until Tullamore at the weekend. The only thing is, Murph, for Offaly, 
mentioned they're going to be playing Leash the week after. So they play this Sunday against Kildare in the Division 2 A-League final. Then the Joe McDonough starts the week after when they host Leash in Tullamore, which might be their most difficult fixture. We talk about player burnout and we talk about no gaps for players and whatever else. That seems crazy to me that they'd have to play so many weekends on the spin. Yeah, there's there's, there's a lot of negatives for for that game, I suppose, of, of play, or that fixture set up of playing week on week. Um, from an awfully point of view, not only from the burnout physically, but they're playing a match on, on a weekend, on a, let's say, a, a Tuesday night, for example, they'll go back in. X amount of players can only do a certain amount because the 15 that played or maybe the five extra that came on can only do X amount. So you now have kind of two sets of players that are, one are kind of doing a certain amount and the other group are going to have to do quite a bit of running as well to obviously accommodate the fact that they hadn't played at the weekend. And there's not a lot of time there also to build on maybe what you've done at the weekend. So you go, let's say, for example, you take a few learnings from the weekend, you maybe take two or three and you go, right, we're going to work on that in training. You can't really do that in a really robust manner when you're, you're about to talk out the following weekend of a Saturday or Sunday. But when you're doing it for eight weeks, there's a different toll that that takes on the body in itself because if you play maybe two or three weeks in a row, you can do that. And and it's tiring and you might pick up a few niggles, fine. But eight weeks is seriously tough on, let's call, let's say, an amateur sport. Like, you know, as in you have lads going working during the week, trying to nurse these injuries, trying to get the right amount of sleep, trying to get the body back right. And then just for preparation from the awfully backroom staff point of view that they want to go, okay, there's things that we really want to work on here in the pitch. And we're not getting a chance to do it because we have this arduous fixture list week on week. So really outside of the top tier, consideration has to be taken in for these teams that like, I don't think this would happen in football at this division level. No. You know, the equivalent division level in football, you would not see a, a, a football team doing this. And that's not to say that, you know, well, it is to an element saying that it's been neglected on a hurling point of view, but I don't think maybe consideration was made for, you know, looking at, at the teams to say, well, what if one team wins X, Y, and Z, or what if this happens? Actually, they're going to be running eight weeks in a row. That's It's crazy stuff, and it's 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 another layer for Offaly to try and deal with that no other team really has to deal with, and uh, expecting to have success with doing it as well. It's 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 not right. It's very unfair on Offaly that, that that this is the hand that they've been dealt. And like I said, I've mentioned a few of them there. There's lots of added stuff that other teams aren't dealing with that they are now dealing with. Um, no more than niggles here and there, mental tiredness, you know, just and, and and the big one for me is that thing of that bit of breathing space after a game where you maybe have two weeks where you can actually go and put something into training where you're seeing that happen at the start of the league. Like if you look at it, awfully since the start of the league, haven't had a week where they could actually go, right, lads, we have three good sessions that we can do in the pitch this week and, you know, really build on really good stuff that we're doing on the pitch and maybe improve another few areas. But they can't do it. They can't do that playing week on week. And look, it's very unfortunate. And you'd hope going forward next year, a team won't be put in the same, the same predicament. Yeah, and before I'm accusing me of wine, last week I said on this very pod before it comes up in the comments that Kildare earned their week off by getting the draw the weekend before. That was the incentive to finish top was that you had a week and you could relax up before playing the Division 2A final. And I also would agree, Skell, with what was said last night on League Sunday and Dowling was very clear on this. I reckon most of the country probably want Kildare to win on Sunday to have a new team in Division 1. I'll just move my head out of the camera here and say, yes, I agree with him. <laughs> Don't give me a bad look. Ah, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. I'd look, if this was anyone else, if this was Kildare against Kerry, I'd be delighted for Kildare to win. I think it's important for Offaly to try and get back to the top flight. But the other problem that Offaly have at the moment is just the accumulation of injuries with the games they've been playing too. So Ocean Kelly, one of their most important players, out with an ACL injury. Ross Ravenhill, broken ankle. Yeah. Patrick Cantwell's out for the rest of the season. Johnny Kelly confirmed after the game. Brian Dygan just about back. Jack Screeny's back. Evan Kelly's out for five weeks. When they've got a young panel and you're very reliant on a few key players within it, just the attrition of these injuries could well catch yeah. up with them and might do end of year. Yeah. Now that's, that's, that's a knock-on effect of playing every week, week in, week out. You have no time to recuperate. If you lose a guy, you're potentially losing him for the whole of your league campaign or championship. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, uh, it's terribly unfair. Like, I just think, you know, the GEA as a whole, they look at kind of the Division 2 in Hurling and everything that's below as an annoyance. 
The other thing as well, Scale, for this weekend is that the game between Offaly and Kildare has got massive stakes because only one team goes up. So your route for promotion means that you have to win the silverware. Unlike, say, the Football League finals, which are on Saturday and Sunday, yeah. two teams have already gone up. Like if you're a Cavan and Fermanagh, say, you're already into Division 2 of the Football League, the silverware would be nice, but you've already achieved some of your season goal already. For these teams, their season may well hinge on what happens on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's just, they, they're, I suppose, it's the football, as we, we've covered before, they have 32 teams. They have an even split in four divisions. So it's, it's, it's just, it's it's a positive outcome for them because they have, you know, they're, they're spoiled with the teams they have. We we don't. We don't have that because there's such a gulf in talent. Like you have, it's a Dublin Derry in the football division too. Yeah. So when they, if they, when they go up to division one next year, they'll cut their cloths pretty well up there. But if you like, if you start promoting two teams and hurling up and down, you know it's there is a goal from talent. It has to be, you know, it has to be said. Like that's why the one team is probably enough for the amount of teams we have in Division One. So it's look, there's no right, there's no right fix to it all. We've covered this before, and mm. we still haven't come up with the answer or even a viable option as to how we flip and fix this situation. But look, yeah, the league we're almost coming to an end tonight. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've, we've identified the problem and while we're looking to usher the championship in the solution is not an easy thing to find as Matty so. Kinney said, said to us before we were going to with an issue he says I don't want to hear your problems I want to hear your solutions <laughs> 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 we all have problems but tell me come to me with solutions <laughs> well look some of the listeners have given us great solutions in recent weeks so by all means for next week where we might have a bit more space uh, come in with some of them uh, some of the comments then uh, TV Street who uh, scale annoyed a few weeks ago and then he annoyed you and now he's back praising you he says scale on Davy was priceless fair play you could see Murphy thinking better get the fire hose scale is getting spicy uh, was his reply which I think was the face on Paul Murphy during that entire slot I actually I have a vivid remember it's only a week ago obviously it's vivid of Murphy's face kind of going oh shit <laughs> <laughs> like, oh god you should sit here quiet don't say a word I forgot to look at my own camera and just see what I looked like on the screen yeah. I was just looking at you going trying to, trying to read your voice there you know yeah. <laughs> just let your man burn his own house okay yeah. you see YouTube was remarkably supportive Stockroom Tim couldn't agree more with Scale's comments on Davy. laughing emoji Adrian McGrath saying the two boys need to change their phone numbers or don't answer any unknown <laughs> numbers for the next couple of weeks and then there was a couple of comments about the structures which was the kind of chat we had around Joe Fortune's comments from the week before uh, Sean Oleka says adding more teams to the two groups would be a good idea in my mind two groups of eight would allow all of the second tier teams to have meaningful matches against similar strength teams as well as against the top sides I saw some reaction kind of tailing off the quotes that I put up from uh, Joe Fortune which are saying that they will only dilute the quality of the top championships if these teams are getting more matches and actually have less meaningful matches because teams are just looking to run up scores against those who are trying to develop so that is the challenge here uh, Michael Redden said Limerick tip Cork have got a home away agreement 2018 league semi-finals in Thurlis that's why Limerick have got home advantage if it's a tip Limerick Munster final is Thurlis because pre-COVID the last final between them was 2019 in Limerick so that was a clarification as to why uh, there was home and away agreements in there Scale, I want you to react to these. I'm not going to see your face because I've got the, the comments up in front of me, but I can watch it back in the video later on. This is the one I was kind of half joking about, which is Reactive user 163368289884843 on TikTok. That's a bot. Themselves, <laughs> haven't put a thing in. It looks body, but he claims I met Scale as a player. I'm glad to say he's the same person in the studio. We don't have a studio. These are our three homes currently. <laughs> a, com- a complete wanker, according to user 163 and a variation of numbers. Uh, you it, were- took, it took me a while to come up with that username now, Will, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alan Alan Crotty forty four on TikTok. Hang on a second. Are we are we going moving on from that? Are we skipping that comment? Yeah. <laughs> well, by all means, respond back to. I it, need apparently. to know. I need to know location. Where's this guy from or girl? I don't know where they're from. Well, we don't know anything about them. Sure. Enough to play it against you. They said. Well, they, look at my friends will tell you right, and this is straight up. I, I and I do admit, at times I can be a thick man. <laughs> okay, so, so it just uh, yeah, it, it's it's whatever has happened that day. Probably caught me in a bad day. Okay. Alan Crotty, also on TikTok, Scale is a clown. Um, not the first time I was called a clown, yeah. That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. John Before Jameson came out with a slightly strange one. I, like, I actually kind of enjoyed these because some of them come up with very different insults and in what they yeah. were saying. Uh, Davey will have them ready about Waterford because your claim at the end was if Waterford go well, it'll be because the players will drive it on. Uh, Scale is not a very desirable individual. You know, that's, that's quite a refined approach, isn't it? Incredibly. Desirable yeah. in what sense? Like, yeah. attractive? <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Uh, Jocko92 was just, just putting down stats and putting down facts here. When he's not goggle bollocksing, which I don't think was the official name mm-hmm. of that title, he's yeah. working on his championship spreadsheet. Well, that's what we want. I mean, work on yeah. the spreadsheet. Very dedicated, to be is fair. This not, is this not a show where we discuss hurling and analyze it? <laughs> I think so. Do we, so. we need, do we need get this? We need analysis. Yeah. John Joe yeah. 56. Skell is questioning Davy Fitzgerald's CV. He talks a lot of bollocks. He sounds bitter. Bitter. Well, what are you bitter about, if you are bitter? Bitter, I'm not bitter. See, how to put this now? I have to be, have to be measured now in my response here because <laughs> uh, this, this could be part he's, two. He, look, he's, he's made this comment about you on the internet and I am affording you the opportunity to reply to what he said. Okay, I am black or white. Simple as that. Okay. So, like, if, if you're thick, just be thick and get on with it. Right? And don't, <laughs> don't act rosy. You know what I mean? So, I just, like... Oh... How do I say? I just don't like his antics. Like I don't like the way he abuses linesmen and referees and gets involved with players. You know, multiple players over the years. Uh, like he's the only manager I can think of that had an actual altercation with a player in a live game. You know, unless I, I'm open to correction now. Correct me here if I'm wrong. Do you remember the Jason Ford incident? Oh, yeah. you know, I, just, I just don't. I just don't I'm, not, I'm not a fan of that. I didn't like the way he he basically shit on Liam Cahill's efforts last year. I'm not a Tipperary man, I'm not a Waterford man. I've no, I've no vested interest in this, but just, again, there's a certain way to go about things. Like, And then when he comes on at the end of the year and say how he's you know, he's wrecked and he's getting the world abuse, and probably is like, and that he might have to step away, like, then don't be ringing Galway when the guy is still in the manager's seat trying to get him out and get in yourself. You know? Like, this, I know this for a fact. Like, so that's, that's what kind of rubs me the wrong way. You know what I mean? Can I ask you a question on behalf of listeners? Because I'm sure this probably ran through a few people's minds. Did you and Davey fall out when you were working together? Um, I wouldn't say fall out. No, no, okay. we didn't like, like, like I'm a thick man, right? And mm-hmm. he's a thick man. Okay. You know, so two wrongs don't make a right. And we've, or did we have a row? We 100% had heaps hapes rows. You know, but we finished on the finest terms. You know, I got injured in my final year, popped out my shoulder. I couldn't do much about it. Um, the club held it against him because we missed, a, 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 I missed an Ireland final intermediate. I think Jane Stewart won the same year, if I'm, if I'm in the junior. If yeah, I'm, 2007. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. So, yes. um, it's just, it's like, yeah, look, it was like two, two rams, you know, loggerheads, as you could say. And that's fine. Like, as a player, see, he was a hero of mine as a player. Like, I loved him watching him as a player. Just the way he goes on and times his antics as a manager. I just don't agree with it. That's it. Dude, I don't agree with it. So, what did your man say? Uh, I'm not a desirable individual. Fine. What do you expect from a, from a pig to a grunt? <laughs> Uh, Matt Kenny I don't think it's Matty Kenny by the way I don't think Matty Kenny's on TikTok uh, <laughs> Sour Galway man a county full of talent yet they underachieve every year and then it goes he brought in the sweeper it worked for a while didn't it which I assume is based on uh, Davy's plans I don't think Davy, by the way I don't think Davy would even claim this himself that he was the originator of the sweeper I think he's just been a guy who's deployed it yeah he's, he's used it right and he stuck to it hmm. so and like, do I agree with the sweeper um Sometimes, let's say if, if, there's a, if there's a major gulf in talent between teams, obviously you might have to deploy one just to, to, to limit the damage. Like, but when you've got a, a savage team, like in, 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 a, in a Warford, don't like, play, play 15 on 15. They're more than capable. Damien Jordan had a pop at all of us. Damien Jordan 145 to give him his full moniker on TikTok. Who are these people with three laughing emojis? Maybe he was just on the wrong podcast. Maybe that's, <laughs> yeah. maybe that's a genuine question. <laughs> Maybe he was. Maybe he maybe was. Maybe he because if he doesn't know, like if he, like if he doesn't know the great Paul Murphy, like Jesus, like, <laughs> what's going on then? Like you know, <laughs> a new moniker for you as well, Skell. Owen Joey Jordan says Skell is Hurling's version of David Brady. You're both in the West. David Brady is Mayo footballer. No. Yes, I know David Brady. Yeah, I know of him. Yeah, what's that supposed to mean? Is that an insult or a compliment? I don't know. Pro- probably a bit of both, really. Um, I, by the way, really enjoy. It can't TV. be a bit of both now. It has to be one another. <laughs> yeah, look, can, can I can I say it's not a bad thing? Like you're two guys who are happy to talk, and in DB's case as well, he'll come out with a few wild comments by his own admission, and he will laugh it off for the best part, or he will justify his opinion, but he'll never hold back, so he'll never yeah. be bland. That's so true, I hope yeah. that's the way that's meant. Yeah. yeah. Sure, uh, sure, I think with this well, podcast, sure you, you're, you're free to speak your mind. Mm. Yeah. Like if we were on television with the national broadcaster, we would be certain. And let's be honest about it, we would be muted to a touch. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We couldn't uh, exactly let out our full persona. Maybe yeah. you, Murph, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 were the late, 
He was on late, late or something before, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was, was released for one, up for the match. Up for the up match, for the yeah. match yeah, yeah. So you see, you're, you're accustomed to people up there in the capital. The one, the one thing I will say with all the people commenting, I think the first about 20 episodes last year when we started recording this, I was slagging Skettle on and off intermittently for that. Before we actually met, because the three of us, like we, didn't, we hadn't met since we started for about 20 episodes. Yeah. And then uh, I remember we were checking into the hotel, or I was checking into the hotel in Limerick for the roadshow we did. And Skettle, you were about two minutes after me. And I was standing at the elevator and I looked back. And it, my 20 episodes of slagging you came back to haunt me. And I went, fuck it, he's way bigger than I remember him being. <laughs> <laughs> and I was looking at this six foot four lad and I went, oh, I'm after slagging him now. And he's going to have a few points of Guinness tonight now. So one thing I will say for the people commenting <laughs> is that Skettle's quite big. <laughs> yeah, I, I can be aggressive at times. <laughs> and I remember, I remember then we met in the hallway inside the office. Hey, sure, we'll go down for a drink there. And I said, let's soften him up here now with a point of Guinness. I know the way to his heart here now. So it's grand. You found it very fast, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the way to my heart. Well, <laughs> then he sabotaged me the two e the chair. Yeah. Ah, no, the, the chair, the chair went down by its own volition. Um, you <laughs> saved your point, and everyone credited you for holding on to it. So, um, and by the way, the vast majority of comments on Instagram, TikTok, everywhere else was actually positive. But it's kind of fun having a look at some of these. Oh, Barry, I, jo- shit. I know you couldn't. That's why I'm throwing <laughs> them at you. Uh, Barry John Marr, hold on. Says the man who ran the length of a pitch in a challenge game in New York to get involved in a schmozzle. Now, it wasn't in New York. That was in Boston, was it not? Yeah, so if you go to Mapping Mapping Future with correct stats. um, Mm. No, it wasn't a challenge game. It was the Super 11. It was the 11s. It was serious stuff. It was Dublin. Uh, There was a row. I didn't know there was a row. There were lads on the ground. I said, fuck it. I'm I'm never as close to the action as I am as I was there because it was a shortened pitch. So I said, fuck it. Let's go for it. Let's just get someone. But how was that a dig at you? How was the the fact that you did that? What's the... I was backing up my teammates and I'd do it again. No, but what I mean is that the comment saying that you ran the length of the field, like says your man, that was the comment, says your man who ran the length of the field. I don't think, what does that got to do with Anthony said last week? I don't think it has um, I probably, that was probably a, a bad act. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd say it's, he's not whiter than white. He can't be judged. Ah, I get you. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. I bet, that's do you want to do, do, you want to do just, just to please that, that guy, I'll go into confession Sunday, I'll say a few Hail Marys and I have pens, right? Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Not sorry. You're absolved, you're absolved on the pod now the two of these are going to roll together because when I put the video in earlier on you were pissed off at me so you can be pissed off at me for uh, the vi- the visual will be here on the YouTube when people are watching this later on but one and one plus two five no four one and one plus two four this sounds very salty from the Galway man lacks class he'd be better placed to keep her quiet after all he cost Galway enough times which I thought was pretty mean spirited harsh enough that now it mm. was pretty harsh now and then, would you reckon? So, so like, would you reckon? Do you know how Bubbles missed the, missed the, the free in the drawing game? Yeah. Would you blame him for that? No. For oh. You don't. Of course not. You don't. You don't pick individual instances. Let's say, which probably my instance probably letting a goal or some sort of or a bad pick or some shit. You know. But again, I have heard that up and down like a lot of times. When people try to get at you, they think it actually gets at you. Mm. Don't give a shit. And the thing is about it as well is because let's say a goalkeeper or a full back line, your mistakes are punishable more fucking often than not yeah. than, you yeah. know a green that, they're, that, they're, that they're more men like I mean a corner forward is a bad game they just have a bad game they don't get the ball but you make a handling mistake that's you know so it's uh, it's easier to point out those as well but like you said the guys think it didn't annoy you but you're the first person to know it like so it's like yeah you know, but you know it's you've come to terms you've dealt with it yeah. you've promised it yeah I didn't get to play at your level, but I still am salty at this stage. 20 odd years on now at this stage, a under 14 Midland Schoolboys League final. I was credited with scoring an own goal, which I didn't score in the final <laughs> as we lost an extra time. And I'm still angry that happened. I was in goal. <laughs> it was not me. It was one of our defenders who actually got a nick on it with his head. Yeah. Went past me in goal. Not a single thing I could do about it. Wasn't his fault. Uh, but yet in the newspaper, it had me down as the OG as the reason that we lost. Uh, so yeah, I, I still hold that pain till now. I it was should, not my fault, but you know what, was. I should do a segment here with you of the funniest goals I've conceded. <laughs> I, by God, I have some rippers. I swear to God. <laughs> I came out, my full back was taking a, a sideline one day in a league game with the club. And he, he maintains when he looked at me up first, I was in the goal. And then when he hit the ball, I was 15 yards along the inline for a short sideline. Mm. He put it straight in the net. <clears throat> like, that was fucking embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I one of them goals where you're almost there to get it and it rolls over the line. Oh, and That's I funny. haven't worked the other side of it, by the way, because, again, I don't know who the reporter was that credited me incorrectly with that own goal. But having been a reporter at games, 
In GEA, it's very difficult to know what to put in your report if someone scores an own goal or an own point. An own, how do you score an own point? It's happened. It happened in the that new senior happened. football championship last year. So a defender Did, yeah. decided to kick yeah. the ball back to his goalkeeper. I think it was a quarterfinal or semifinal. It basically hit the pitch, which is quite hard in the middle of summer. Bounced, bounced right. straight over the crossbar. And the reporter's just there going, do I put down OP? What do I put down here? <laughs> um, I remember seeing a defender a few years ago in a game I was covering to who headed the ball over his own bar because it looked like a goal was about to happen. And so he decided, couldn't quite get his hands up to it because he was in close spaces, headed yeah. over. And all the reporters in the press box just looked at each other as if to say, not sure what we're meant to do here. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it went down, I think, as 0-1 just as himself. So it was really weird. But everything has to tally because people yeah. want to check the scores. It's, it's Career, just, uh, have you any mean tweets from Murph, no? None yet, but should I give me this Hang on, give me, give me two minutes. Give me two minutes. Yeah, you, you, get, you get tweeting. <laughs> Murph so, is an absolute... <laughs> <laughs> but then Skellen, this is totally related to the last one I, I promise this is all nicely themed Bazo777 was in contact uh, yesterday not a question but did you see Skell's howler he let in against Tipperary in 2008 it was shown on the build up to Limerick against Tipperary on TG Carr on Saturday so I flicked the video in earlier on you were like you're on my bad list now at this stage all I want to do is show you the goal that Bazo was talking about because I found it in the intro oh yeah but like, saying Tipperary League Final 2008 wasn't enough information. Oh, yeah, put in the video. <laughs> I had to go back and have. I had to go back it's actually a funny story because yeah, look now, like I, I enjoy playing with like, but he had mm. me primed before the game that if Larry Corber comes within the vicinity, I want you to physically hurt him. You know, hit him like with your body, not put across him, but just hit him like with shoulder, Anton. So I was going out. I just scored a point from a free. I was come back in and I buried Larry's shoulder as I come back in. Hyper. Mm. Next ball, Benny Dorn hits it. <laughs> And I'm coming, I'm coming for this fucking ball. I'm coming out. But I forgot one thing. I forgot the ball. <laughs> cool. Those, are, those as are walking back, as will walking be treated back. to this as Scales talking about it. Oh, yeah. But like it was a dribbly old ball in as well. It was a dirty top spin. But as I missed the ball, right? As I'm walking back, right? Or turn back, Larry goes, hey, you, settle down in a little bit. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> Settle down, young lad. <laughs> You'd have another, what, 12 seasons of intercounty hurling after that, so it didn't affect oh, you that badly. Yeah. But it's one of those you probably learned from, though. Like, if you were in a calmer state of mind, you would have probably let your defender deal with that, or you would have come out and ball first, not been worried about hitting him, and you would have cleared oh, it away. Oh, she was hyper. Like, as, as, hmm. like, as a goalie, that's, that's probably the, that's the last emotion you want, is pure hyperness. You know, you want to be just cool and calm. So that was, that was a harsh lesson, in fairness. Yeah. TG, TG, yeah, there was another goal I think in that game as well TG Carr could have shown that instead but they did show uh, yeah the goal went down to Dunn eventually but um, it slipped through your grasp a few questions Murph to, to fly through that come in in the Instagram as well uh, this one from Maffei who comes to us most weeks if you're Liam Cahill how do you approach Limerick next time round what should tip change change uh, I don't know if there's anything they could Change like I think what Liam Cal would be looking for is he'd obviously be looking for a more of a spread of scores. How do you get more of a spread of scores? More players creating options as as Tipper on the attack. Um, I suppose without trying to expose yourself in defence, you know, which is uh, it sounds like you're 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 contradicting yourself there. But like they created really good scores, but just not often enough. And as we said, they had six scores during the game, whereas Limerick had eight who scored two points or more and had 12 scores overall. So Liam Cal looked to have a few more scores on the board. He'll also, I suppose, look to try and see, OK, well, how did we manage to close down Limerick so well in the first half and sustain that in the second half to create at least a platform that whereby in the last few minutes we're either winning, drawn, or down by three points, but we're still in the game. So that's what Liam Cal will be looking to do. And they're, they're headed in the right direction. Like, no team at this stage of the league was looking to be peaking. Like Liam Cal, next time he wants to play them at an important time, and Liam Cal will be hoping that's a monster final, will be then all these things come right. It's actually no good at coming right now against Limerick because, you know, they'll have found you out at that stage. So the few things he looked for, he looked for a more of a spread of scores, but I don't think it's fair to say it looked trying to change. Like Limerick were just better on the day and, and Tipperary didn't do too many things wrong, but he looked to build on what they've done this time and say, right, we had six scores, brilliant, but we need a few more people. And asking the question, which I think Liam Cal would be really good at, at, at figuring out, is how do we do that? How do we go about doing it? It's one thing to say we need more scores, but how do we actually create that space? And maybe even learn from a few of the things that Limerick did and say, well, look how they create space. Maybe we have the players to go and do that. 
So I don't think there's a whole lot to be changed um, because I think a lot of the stuff they did, they did really well. They were just beaten by a better team. So those are a few of the markers. I think he looked that the next time they go into championship, they're going to be looking for 10 scores. They're going to be looking to create in space where Jake Morris can go and score the goal. Let's say Jake Morris. Uh, open it up, create that, that space. But then also when Limerick have the ball, shut them down early and stop these runners coming through the middle. Okay. Um, Electric Dinny, I'm going to keep your comment for next week for the guys to pick a team. But the question scale would be before you pick it, because I know you want to get out your book and write this out and take lads out and put lads in and whatever. Would the best of the rest of the country beat Limerick in a one-off game? As in, can join every other, other county? You can have a 15 from every other county, put them together. I, I don't know the hypotheticals about how much training they could have beforehand and all that kind of stuff. But would a 15 assembled from the rest of the country be better than this current Limerick team? See, now, now you know what I'm going to do, don't you? You know I'm going to go, go out and write it for next week, yeah. I'm going to pick it off now. Damn you, that. Yeah. Another couple of hours gone. <laughs> can, I, can we pause that question and come back to it next week? That's what I mean. It's more for now, yes yeah. or no. Yeah. That's would what you I mean. know, like, like early doors now, would you be able to say yes or no? That's basically it. You don't have to come back with such a decisive answer now, like, mm. you know, in terms of naming the team. But should it have to? Of course, they'd have yeah. to, wouldn't they? I'd say the same. Yeah, of course. You're, you're, you're piecing the best players in the country yeah. in every position. Yeah. Know, against, you would say they'd have to. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put that together for next now, week. Now, I will right? say. Go on. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, go on. Go on. Little catch here. You know what? I always, I always wonder, you know, the British and Irish Lions tour? Mm. Yeah. Why can they, why can they can never get over the team? You know, when you, when you take four of the top six or seven countries, it's always a question in my head. I think it's just time together. Like, yeah, preparation totally, time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you have a lot of different uh, teams in rugby playing different brands, playing different styles, playing different strengths. And then I suppose, like, the communication with Limerick, there's one thing alone as to why they're so good because they're playing week on week. They understand each other. Lots of players have been played together from a young age. So, like, if, yeah, you could pick a 15 from Ireland, uh, from, Ireland from the rest of Ireland that would beat this Limerick team. But I would say that if you're really to go into the weeds on it, yeah, it's 15 from the rest of Ireland, but training together over a long period of time to build up that bit of understanding with a good game plan and on you go. It's not a case of if next weekend they have an all-star match versus Limerick. I actually think Limerick win that match yeah. because that team would be disjointed because they're playing different brands. You have a tight to Burke type sweep and roll, for example, playing, let's say you throw tight to Burke at centre-back, but then you have, you know, a Connerly Han at centre forward running around expecting the type of ball he gets with Cork. He doesn't get that off tight to Burke and that's the disjointedness that you're going to have. Yeah. Well, That's why I'm intrigued about your teams next week. This is the homework now ahead of uh, Sunday. What's our homework? 15, you rest of Ireland. 15, and you got it. I reckon as well, you got to try and balance this out because what will naturally happen here is you'll go, let's pick the best six scoring forwards that we could possibly pick. Yeah. I want a functional team that will be able to take Limerick down and you've got every other oh. county to pick from. <sighs> Last question. I have my goalie in six packs. Ah, yeah, I knew I knew you'd start. So give me a goalie and backs from this now because this was Detox now, 101 when the Sunday game was on. Straight away, top of my head now stuff. That's fine. Or like, by all means. Uh, I've Mikey Butler cornerback. I've Dahi Burks centre back. Or, or, or full back. Uh, Win fit. Cahal Barrett to the corner. I've Ronan Maher at five. John Connell at six. Tagged Burke at seven. Don't don't give away any more. Always leave them waiting for more for during the week. Okay, so now I'm going to, so can I stop now? I'll put away yeah, stop. Pad. Stop, yeah. I'll put away yeah. the rope head. Come back <laughs> to it later on. I've got a couple of midfielders. I'm going to find yeah. out where Connor Whelan and Colin Mannion fit into this team, etc, etc. You can work that yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, Detux 101. This was after the Sunday game revelation that the hurling was going to be first last night. He said, idea for the pot. How about you pick a team 2010 onwards or the last 25 years? So that's left us a little bit more room here of Sunday game panellists it would be a fair team. Now, I'm not sure if that means the players had to play in the last 25 years because, uh, you know, you could have Eddie Kerr there if you wanted, if it was people who've been on telly the last 25 years doing the analysis. But um, here's a selection that I thought of that had been on recently because the fir first port of call was I started scribbling down people who've been on in the last 10 years who would have played in the last 10 years. And it was actually not that many because generally there was a fairly settled panel for quite a while before that. But if you wanted players who played in the last 25 that have been on the telly, you have Cummins, Davy Fitz, Jackie Tyrrell, JJ, Paddy Marr, Anthony Daly, Brendan Marr, Joe Canning, Henry Shefflin, John Milan, Eddie Brennan, DJ Carey, Paul Flynn, Declan Ruth, Michael Dignan. There are players who played inside the last 25 that I can think of. There's probably more. The one problem is, and this is what, probably what's been exposed here, is that generally you get quite a few goalkeepers, a lot of forwards, and not too many midfielders. Like, if I'm going to make a team, I probably have to put Joe Canning in with Brendan Marr just to make this actually fit. Who do you guys, because I sent this into you last night about the fact this would come up, 
Who's getting into your team from the Sunday game panelists here? Pete Finnerty. Yeah, Pete Finnerty should be there. Now, he, he obviously hasn't played for the last 25, but he's been on the panel the last 25, hasn't he? He's your, he's your centre half back. Mm. Yeah. Quite a lot of forwards there as well, isn't there? A lot of them, yeah. Mm. Jesus, that's a tricky one. Yeah. Like, if you put, if you put Finnerty in, right? Then you've got a few options where you can be a little bit creative. But like you would definitely be putting Anthony Daly, I would say, into your half back line, I would suggest. Was uh was Tommy Dunn ever on the on the panel? Ooh, might have been. Probably wasn't a regular, but I think he's been on doing analysis, hasn't he? See, the Sunday game is a funny one as well. You know, when you ask about the Sunday game here, do you include people who've done one-off games or do they have to have been a regular in the couch? Yeah, because there were years it's... where it was like Finnerty, Cyril, like there was a fairly small crew that did nearly all the Sundays. Mm. Yeah. And then you'd have, you know, like one Lee Jin has done it, like yeah. things like this. So, uh, like you think back there, Richie Hogan has done it. You know, as in there's been one-off kind of... Tomas McCann. So, I'd say probably resident lads. Lads who've yeah. been on it, you know... Yeah, I'd be fine with putting Macaulay on it. I'm just not sure how wedded Detox 101 is to the idea of the last 25 years being their playing career. Because if if it's not their playing career, if they've just been on the Sunday game for the last 25, then you've got a bit more wiggle room, I think. Okay. Mm. We need clarity on that. And I think we need to draft up a bigger group of, let's say, I, I'd, I'd struggle to name even the lads that you named there, Will, just mm. you know, off the top of my head. So if we had a consolidated list now, you'd make a fair crack at it. Let's leave it open to the comment section. Particularly so two, those if they've done two episodes, episodes or more, uh, if they put it into the comments, we'll, we'll draft something from that. That's two teams now for next week. All right, yeah, because I've got a pool of players here and we can add to them then and put them into positions. <laughs> she scales going to be off work all week. Oh, I'm sweating. I'll be the minor game on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> But before we go, Skell, one word on that. Um, good start for Galway and Leinster at the weekend as well. You were up in Darver, weren't you? Yeah, historic start. First game in Leinster. Um, worked out well. Missing a couple of players, so came away with results, which is the most important thing. Um, I have to say, Darver is a fine spot. Great, great mm-hmm. facility. Uh, great setup. Um, a long way up now. A long way up. I thought they could have brought it down to Abbottstown, you know what I mean? <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a middle of the ground area. But uh, we have Leash this weekend in Port Leash. So uh, round two, so just have to um, continue the business. There you go. Welcome to the accommodating Leinster Championship where you get to play against, where Connacht can meet Ulster in the first round of the Leinster Championship. That's how accommodating <laughs> we are. Yeah. We're qualified now, would you believe? Yeah, because I think it's just two out of three come out of the group, don't they? Yeah, you get into a preliminary, no, it's, four, it's a group of four, and, okay. and if, you, if you win one game, you get to a preliminary, preliminary quarterfinal. Right. Speak at The round before the round. <laughs> and then we have Kilkenny next week. Um, I don't know if it's a good Friday or holiday Saturday I'm not sure it's that weekend isn't it yeah in Nolan Park so Murph, I expect to be welcomed with open arms okay. there's, a, there's a room here for you and all so. <laughs> just make sure the fridge is full <laughs> it'll be like the New Zealand boys before the World Cup was it in 93 or something poisoning you the night before now so nice, yeah. <laughs> oh, and this reminds me there's one last story we have to get out of Paul Murphy here I forgot all about it until you mentioned Lions Tours and so on Tommy Welsh, you guys go into their house, Murph, because you were asked about this uh, oh, yeah. during the week. Yeah. Uh, it came up after Gary Ringrose's <laughs> yeah, dad's yeah, house yeah. was hit by the entire Irish rugby team. Yeah. And I saw a video, which I hadn't seen before, of you guys descending on Tommy Welsh's house. Tell us, why did you end up going to Tommy's house? Like, Did Tommy just not want <clears throat> to go out that night? Was it a similar circumstance? It was one of the days after 2014, so after the replay, and... The full, the full set of was, I mean, this is probably the third day or fourth day or something anyway. Um, but we were in a pub in Kilkenny and it was kind of this thing of lads were coming in in dribs and drabs for the full Irish and get a few pints. And lads were going, what are we doing? Where are we going? And the novelty, lads were already speaking of it was, lads, we're going to go to a pub out in the sticks somewhere, find somewhere we don't usually go where no one will be expecting us and we'll all land in and it'll be hilarious. And, you know, so out of nowhere then, a lad turned up outside with a bus nobody rang him and he said lads I have a bus there I'll bring you wherever you want to go so we were going Jesus this is some kind soul who's gone I've got a minibus come on now yeah I I still don't know who it was and um, so we were like great where do we go and I think Taggy had just kind of said lads I don't even want to buy us in Erlingford we'll go to Erlingford and we said brilliant we'll go up to the border with Tim and we'll go to to Erlingford so we were all happy to head out there and next thing someone was on the phone going lads Tommy isn't coming out now Marlies his wife was pregnant at the time in fairness to him with their second child so Tommy's like, I'm going to wait for a few days, you know, but Tommy was the catalyst for crack on the bus 
Tommy would not, you know, enjoy someone after a game not having crack. He'd have to create a game. He'd have to do something. He was just up to high dough on the bus on the way home. So we said, Jez, we can't not bring Tommy out. And he would love it if we went to him. So we said, Shaman, will you bring us to Erlingford? Or we're going to go out by a Tuller, via Tullerone, which is not the way you go to Erlingford. And the roads were winding. Lads were as sick as a dog going out of the road. And so we stopped. And I remember what was after happening at the time was, Finn, who was Tommy's son, was after hiding the keys for the house. Tommy couldn't actually get out of the house. So we got up and we all got off the bus, lads, pints in hands. We looked in, here was Tommy in the sitting room. And he was just like this, going, <laughs> seeing all of us coming across the lawn. Because Tommy would always say, ah, oh, the spirit in the team, the spirit's brilliant. And he, even more specifically, he'd say, ah, oh, the backs of some spirit. The forwards are you, the, no spirit in the forwards, but the backs of great spirit. So Tommy swings open the window, then he goes, ah, yes, there's some spirit in this team. It's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> So that was it. And basically then he said, look, lads, give me half an hour. We went into Tullerone. We turned on the game in Tullerone, had a few pints. And Tommy bust in the door about half an hour later, ready to go for the day. So that was That's it. Brilliant. That's brilliant. That was great, crack. It was absolutely That's great. We got, we got the photo as well. And Tommy has the head out brilliant. the window. Yeah, yeah. That's even better than Gary Ringrose. Because in Ringrose's case, he's got like a massive gaff. Well, it's his parents' house. But like, you yeah. know, I can go in, have a bit of enjoyment in there. The fact that Tommy actually didn't let you down went probably had a quick shower got dressed eventually made his excuse and went there's 20 lads outside so I'm going to have to yeah, go into the town and have a pint and yeah. turn up is, is a cracker and, and it was brilliant because he lives next door to the parents so Mick was in next door Mick's a great crack as well and uh, Mick looks in over the hedge and here's the whole lot of us on the lawn and Mick went ah Jesus is brilliant so Mick got on the bus as well <laughs> yeah, Mick ended up out in Erling for having pints so it was absolutely brilliant yeah Bloody hell. We're slowly but surely getting an insight into that Kilkenny team. Lads, it's been a pleasure. We'll talk to you again. We're going to be a day earlier this week. We're going to do Sunday to do the uh, preview of the league yeah. final uh, so that Murph can go one of his 15 holidays for the year. So Thanks very much. we're going to be a day early. Lads, <laughs> we'll talk to you the weekend. So, lads. OTB's The Hurling Pod. With Board Gosh Energy. Proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship.